Okay, well, good morning. Um, both those of you here in person and uh, those of you online, welcome to the Floodplain Symposium co-hosted by the Sac State Water Contractors and the Northern California Water Association. Historically, during high flow events in winter months, the rivers in the Central Valley would rise up over their banks and create a vast floodplain, which was described as the Inland Sea. This floodplain provided ideal habitat for fish, migratory birds, and other species. But in the early 1900s, levees and bypasses were constructed to corral mighty rivers and push water quickly through the system to combat devastating floods. With the construction of these levees, 95% of the Central Valley's historic floodplains are cut off from the river. Today, we are working to recreate a portion of these historic floodplains and the habitat that they provided. Farmland, primarily ricelands, wildlife refuges, private wetlands, the rivers, and flood bypasses can be managed together in innovative ways to mimic the historic floodplain to recreate a dynamic fisheries and wildlife conservation landscape that continues to provide flood protection for communities and nearby lands. As you will hear from the speakers today, spreading out and slowing down water across the landscape mimics natural flows and provides multiple benefits year round by allowing farmers to cultivate rice and other crops for humans during the spring and summer, habitat for wild birds, reptiles, and other fauna in the fall, and food for migratory birds and native fish species in the winter. During the program, we will discuss the latest research on Central Valley floodplains to inform su successful implementation of multi-benefit restoration projects. Our participants today include Jacob Katz with California Trout, who will be providing a floodplain overview, which is titled The Power of Puddles. Uh, Alexandra Wampler from UC Davis and Paul Butner with the California Rice Commission, which they'll be providing an overview of the California Riceland Salmon Project. Carson Jeffries from UC Davis will be uh, providing an update on the science uh, effort that he's engaged in called Salmon Eye Lenses, Otoliths, and Habitats. Jacob Montgomery with Cal Trout will be describing what's going on with the fish food program. That's an ongoing program in the Valley. Uh, Mark Petrie with Ducks Unlimited will be providing an overview of floodplains and the Pacific Flyway. After lunch, Lewis Bear with Reclamation District 108 and Barry O'Regan with KSN will be providing a description and uh, overview of the floodplains reimagined effort. Uh, they'll be followed by David Guy, who will be providing with the Northern California Water Association, who will be describing the efforts of the participants in the Floodplain Forward Coalition. And then to wrap up, uh, for folks that didn't get an opportunity to ask questions uh, during the course of uh, the speakers, we'll have a Q&A and discussion period at the end. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to Jacob. Thank you, Jacob. Oops. Thanks, Todd. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here together, um, you know, to be back in person. Um, many of you on the, uh, you know, joining us virtually, you can't see the room, but uh, so many of uh, our colleagues uh, who uh, spend, spend their days and their effort trying to, to make a, a better functioning Sacramento Valley, Central Valley, a better California one that really works for for people and for the environment right and so we're going to be talking about the ways in which water interacts with landscape uh, we're going to be talking about understanding the patterns of how water flows over and through the landscapes where our our rivers meander right um let's see got this right here so i would love to take a little meandering path myself um, and start with this. While we're here to talk about floodplains, to talk about rivers, to talk about water, um, and that's, there, there, there's plenty there, know that the conversation we're having is also being, ha you know, is also being conducted, also taking place in all the other recess di resource disciplines, right? We, as, as Californians, we as, as people, are in the midst of a reevaluation um, of how we live on the landscape, 
right? How we live as part of that landscape. So whether we're trying to understand the flow of fire through forests, trying to better uh, grok how animals flow across grasslands, how sediment flows down rivers to feed the tidal marshes, which are the best defense against a rising sea. Um, understanding the flow of natural processes, the flow of natural resources um, is, is critical. Um, and where those natural processes are interrupted by, by human land use, by our infrastructure, each one of those places, whether it's Smokey the Bear putting out fires in California's forests for five generations, or dams and levees. The interruptions of those natural processes are exactly the places where we see not just our greatest challenges, endangered species, drying aquifers, catastrophic fire, but also our greatest opportunities. So with that, we'll get back into the Sacramento Valley. Um, I'm going to focus on the Sacramento Valley today, not because it's more important than any other place, but because it's the place I know. It's the place I call home. Um, and so when, when you hear me, please don't think that what we're talking about doesn't apply to the San Joaquin or to the estuary of the Russian or the Eel or the Smith or the Ventura. It does. Um, but in an effort not to speak completely in generalities, um, we're going to talk about the specifics of the Sacramento Valley, both how it functions and who, uh, who's doing the work, the relationships, both uh, physical and you know, both natural and human communities. So the Sacramento Valley, before it was this amazing mosaic of agricultural productivity, was a river wetland corridor. It was millions of acres that every year with the coming of rains or with the melting of snow, our rivers would spread and slow across the landscape through which they flow. And that creates an incredible tapestry, a, a diversity of biophysical habitat. What do I mean? A different a, a pattern of interaction between water and landscape that gave rise to our native biota to our native fish, to our native birds, to the native plants and animals. Each one of those native critters, and I'm going to call them all critters because I can't, can't help it, trees included, they're all shaped by, formed by, the long exposure to those patterns, right? So they have a set of evolutionary keys that unlock the landscape's resources. And when our land use, when our dams and diversions, when our levees, when our drainage, when our uh, farms and cities interrupt those patterns so that our native critters can no longer recognize the valley that they evolved in, to which they're adapted, that's when we get endangered species. That's when we get this extinction threat. So if we use that context, if we understand that we've simplified what was once a beautifully complex valley. If we understand how that simplification worked, then maybe we can incorporate some of that knowledge into the way we manage. And the first way to do that is to understand the Sac Valley itself, the, the forces which created the valley, the river, right? And these fluvial processes, the simple action of water flowing downhill created one of the most fertile and agriculturally lucrative landscapes on Earth, right? But it did it in a way that's counterintuitive to folks that don't live here. At least from Chico down to the bay, the Sacramento River is actually flowing on an elevated platform that it has created itself, that the glaciers, that the uh, erosion of the Yuba and Battle Creek and Clear Creek, uh, those sediments that come down in the tributaries and in from the headwaters of the Sacramento itself, as the waters lose their power, as they lose the, uh, the capacity to hold that sediment up, it drops out. And as it 
flattens out, it drops out on either side of the natural, of, of, the, of the stream itself. And we call those natural levees. I'm going to go point to them. Right? So the levees that we have now are often built on top of these natural levees. Why is this so critical? Why, why am I spending time here? Because the river itself is actually the high point. On either side of the river, then, are the, the ground slopes away. What we're looking at here towards the top is the Feather River coming into the Sacramento River. On the right, we have the, 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 uh, the Cross Canal, which drains Auburn and Natomas. Um, all of that, though, is just an illustration. Here's the Sacramento coming, coming south by the airport right here. What I want you to see is all that red. That red is high ground. Going into yellow, lower, green is the lowest. What it shows is that there are these low areas off to either side of our river channels. We call those flood basins, right? And this is the simple fact. Water doesn't just flow south on a map. It flows downhill. So when the Sacramento would flood, whether from rain in fall and winter or uh, snow melt in spring, the water would come up over those natural levees and flow out into these large depressions, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of acres in extent. And those flood basins are the defining factor of the Sacramento Valley, right? And we might not think of them as flood basins now. Maybe instead you think of them as counties. But they took their names before the county districts, you know, boundaries were set. We live on a landscape that has a certain intrinsic logic. And whether the you know, Calusa Butte, American Yolo, each one of these are essentially large puddles that would have formed them seasonally. But what happened? Well, since European settlement in the Sacramento Valley, there was a rapid and really fundamental change. Development, right? But that development is actually pretty easy to describe. What you're seeing here is the act of, of dredging, taking a channel, scooping out the muck from in that little stream channel and piling it on either side, right? Building what? Levees. Those levees, thousands of miles of them, really successfully divorced that wetland landscape from the river channels. This ubiquitous drainage has had incredible benefit. That's what allows us the consistency, the, the security to not just be safe from flood, but also to grow food that really is important, not just for the economy, but for the food security of not just the state, but the nation. Right? But from the very beginning, there was little understanding of the consequences of that divorce of land and water. And I'm putting up a quote here that you won't be able to read from and back, but I'll read for you really quickly. Um, that dapper man and his waiters is uh, Bishop Scofield, who in 1911, in the very first report of the Fisheries Commission of California, reported as the idea for our bypasses, which I'll get to, was just coming about, said the latest proposal to build canals or bypasses within the overflow basins. That's what they called those flood basins. So that they will be readily drained as the river falls would be the saving of myriads of fish, and especially of salmon, fry, and should be encouraged. So from the very onset of the act of reclamation, we see that we were thinking that it would actually be good for fish, that fish really belong in the river, and that the river belonged in its banks. This kind of thinking, that it's most convenient if the river stays put, really affects and drives much of our, not just water policy, but the way we manage the landscape today, right? And it really started to change very recently. Um, this is um, a slide up here that I have just to give proper due to Ted Summer, our colleague, uh, fairly recently retired from the Department of Water Resources. 
and it was his efforts and his insights uh, around the turn of this last millennium that really sent us on this floodplain path uh, in the Sacramento Valley. And I have, a, there's a little picture of him here in the bottom right just as homage, but the middle of the screen is the important piece. And I'm just gonna illustrate it with my fingers. But what it says is with, with a levied river, with a river that is divorced from the landscape, that has steep sided instead of shallow slope separating the water from the landscape, when you have a steep sided levee, you get more water, but you don't get any more habitat when you fill that up, right? On the other hand, the way the, the, the landscape used to be, right, where you had a much larger but shallower slope that separated water from landscape, with a little bit more water, you got a lot more habitat. So what's fundamental about this is that the world we've inherited, a Sacramento Valley that has almost every single stream rip-wrapped and levied, means that more water down those channels produces very little habitat benefit. Another point along this, this journey to get beyond the thin blue line, line, right, to get beyond the idea of a river trapped between two levied banks, was uh, happened down in the Kasumnis River, right, which is the only tributary to the Sacramento and San Joaquin major tributary that, uh, that isn't dammed. So when it does rain in the mountains that drain the Kasumnis, the river comes up. And when it comes up, it flows into a small little piece of relatively uh, uh, similar functioning uh, habitat in the, in the lower Kasumnis, as, as has happened always. Uh, I, wouldn't, I don't know if pristine's the right word, but a piece of the Kasumnis that works similarly to the way the valley worked previous to development. And Carson Jeffries, who you'll hear from uh, next, did his master's work down there and gave us really, I think, the first window into what a Sacramento River salmon actually should look like. He did an experiment caging fish on one side of the levee and the other. On one side, he put fish in cages in the stream channel, where they belong. That's fish habitat. On the other side, he put them out on the floodplain, on the, in the marsh, uh, in, the, in the swamp, where, where they surely didn't. And the results were so dramatic that they continued to surprise. The floodplain fish had grown many times as fast as those in the river. And that gave us a glimpse into some of the processes that we might be missing. The fish were a window into how the Sacramento Valley might actually function. But it was an important lesson that needed to be put into context. With functioning floodplains, when fish were re-exposed to something like the patterns that they had evolved under, that they were adapted to, they responded really dramatically. But there's almost no place in the valley that actually looks like that. The lower Kasumnis is a posted stamp. There are several others that are of similar size, but we've lost the vast majority of those millions of acres that used to provide this incredible mosaic, this, the, the, the diversity of different kind of floodplain habitats. That said, that, you know, well, here, we'll just illustrate that really quickly, right? What you see here with the Sutter Buttes in the middle of the Sacramento Valley, all of those shades of green just illustrate and brown illustrate different kinds of floodplain and wetland, uh, willow thicket, emergent vegetation, uh, tules that were here previous to, to European settlement. And this is what's remnant today, crumbs, right? And on top of that, though, is the overlay of the marsh ground, which is farmed to rice. An important context, there are what? What's rice? A, a marsh-adapted grass that bears, you know, a, a heavy seed head, and it is grown right in the heart of the former Sacramento floodplain. 500,000 acres of it in a good year. So <clears throat> I guess the context that I'd like you to think about is why we can never go back. Maybe in looking back, in understanding and applying a 21st century ecological understanding of how the valley actually functioned, 
we can move forward into a future that actually incorporates that knowledge of nature and natural process into our management of it. And in so doing, we can identify those places where our land use, where our policy, where our management is interrupting natural process to the detriment of the creation of natural wealth and actually approximate or mimic those natural patterns, right? We can create a world that we, we desire, one that once again has the natural abundance that so many think that we permanently traded off for when we went from a natural world to one of, of agricultural production. And, and I'm here to say that I don't think that's necessarily uh, um, a inevitable trade-off. And I think the success is right before us. Every winter, the Sacramento Valley fills with wings, right? The success is right there in the sky, that if you manage this landscape to give native critters a world they recognize, they'll respond dramatically. And I say that because when I was a kid in this valley, when rice was still burned, before it began to be flooded in the early 90s, not only was the air thick with smoke, you know, starting in August all the way through, but, you know, there was a, a notable absence of wings, right? And bird numbers were at all-time lows then, and now, 30 years later, we see incredible abundance returning year after year. And what was the change? Was it a major revolution? Did we have to... Did we have to back away from agricultural production? Did we have to give back to nature? No, we learned to compromise a little, to mimic, to take those same fields that produce food for people in summer and in winter, allow them once again to create incredible abundance for wildlife, in this case for, for, for birds. Just to get a feel for some of that incredible abundance. Uh, think about this. I mean, maybe the best thing to do is encourage you to go to Grey Lodge this winter. See if you can get there at dawn. And as the fish, oh, wait a minute, no, they're birds. <laughs> as they take off, as the, as the geese take to the sky, not only is it like this, an unbelievable spectacle, but you can actually feel the thunder of it in your chest. The abundance, the incredible engine of natural productivity that is this valley is right here to be reharnessed. And so it's with that success story that we turn back to puddles and fish, right? So we saw that farm fields could be managed in such a way that they could provide incredible benefit for migratory ducks, geese, shorebirds going from the Amazon to the Arctic. But what if we looked at those same fields as mimicking the fertile floodplain wetlands that Carson had shown Sacramento salmon were also adapted to? And so in 2011, we went into Yolo Bypass to attempt to do just that. We put um, you know, thousands of fish into the flooded uh, uh, corner of a rice field, which I fondly call a mud puddle. And we tracked their growth. And what we saw was phenomenal growth. They not only survived, they thrived, right? And so what we saw was that a surrogate marsh, that, that ag field could be fantastic habitat for fish as well as for birds, and still be planted again come spring to create food for people. In the years after, Carson and I and our colleagues uh, did another experiment looking at, oh, so that's documented in Cats et al. to 2017. Each one of these is a, is a paper which you can, which you can access. Um, so in the Sac River, we then went to see well, what was fueling that growth. And again, we caged fish. That's what's down here. That's what we're looking at. Those are floating cages, each with 10 fish in them. We did that in the river at spate, at, at flood. This was the, as good a conditions as, it, as, as the river gets if you're a fish, right? We did it just on the other side of the levee, 30 yards from those cages, looking on the other side. You have floating cages in the canal. What's the canal? The canal is the way that water flows across 
that formerly activated floodplain now, right? And then we had our surrogate wetlands. Just on the other side of that canal are the fields that were intentionally flooded using the same irrigation canals that would use to create uh, a summer crop, but now we're using them to mimic the long duration uh, 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 shallow uh, flooding uh, of, of the floodplain. And we saw an amazing thing. We had seven times the growth out there on the floodplain compared to in the river. But now we had an idea of why. The beaker on this side is taken from the river. You can see from its clarity, it lacks, it lacks bugs, it lacks food. The canal had 600 times as much. That seems like a lot until you get out to the floodplain. The floodplain had 150 times as much. That's 15,000 times more protein. Now, I know that's a big number, but just think about that maybe economically, because that's what we're talking about, is density of resources. Imagine what the pay grade would be for a CEO that increased the profit of the company by 600%. Now think about improving it by 15,000. We have been squandering the very wealth, the very currency that actually creates abundant fish populations by interrupting the patterns of inundation. Let's ask, what is flooding, right? Well, let's just go through it, right? So when the water spreads, right, when it spreads out onto that floodplain, what's happening? Sunlight, of course is falling down onto that floodplain. In summer, it's going to be gathered by plants. In winter, when that water spreads out, <coughs> algae is going to be floating in that water, also gathering winter sunlight, right? Either way, that photosynthetic energy, that energy stored in, in plant and algae matter, right, is entered into the water, where microbes begin to break it down. Those microbes then are fed on by zooplankton, small invertebrates, which are eaten by bigger invertebrates, which then are eaten by small fish, which rapidly become big fish. So what's the point here? Well, the first one is that what we're talking about is energy flow. What we're actually talking about with flooding is the means by which rivers access the energy they need to make abundance. What, it, what is a levee? Well, a levee turns out to short circuit the very capacity to have recovery, to have abundant, robust fisheries resources, right? We didn't do that on purpose, but we did do it by design. This is a system that we built, and that means that we can actually design an understanding of the energy flow, of the ecological relationships, of the function into the system that we manage, right? The critical piece here also is not just about the extent of the floodplain. We talk about acres all the time. It's important, right? It's not just about the number of bugs. It's about the time it takes to actually move that solar energy stored in plant matter into the water. And it happens in, well, here, let's look at this. So on the right, you have that same beaker. In the Sacramento River, the water's turning over every couple seconds. In the canal, every couple minutes and out on the floodplain every couple days. What that means, was that 10, Ten minutes? Um, what that means is you have given out on the floodplain the aquatic ecosystem, the processes which actually move energy into the species that we care about, that have incredible economic impact on California's economy, we have short-circuited those processes by not giving enough time. What, what, again, I just, it's so complicated, right? Well, no, it's not. It puddles. Because humanity seems to abhor a puddle, we drain the water off the landscape as quickly as we can everywhere. It's as true in your backyard, as a Safeway parking lot, as an ag field, or even the very flood bypasses that we're talking about as the great floodplain opportunities. Those two are designed to drain as rapidly as possible. So in so doing, we actually inhibit the very landscape from creating the 
species that we say we value, right? So what are puddles? Puddles are spreading and slowing water, right? That's residence time. That residence time is puddle power. That's the difference between the fish on the top, a fish that is confined to the river. The rivers are essentially food starved. And there is a popular misconception, I think, that there aren't fish, you know, that, that the, the Central Valley, the Sacramento Valley can't produce salmon. The truth is that in a good year, well over 100 million fish the size of that small one can be produced, just in the gravels of the Sacramento and Feather. The issue is that we rarely see those fish again. That's top fish that doesn't have access to floodplain-derived food resources, stays that small. And in order for it to come back as an adult, it's going to have to hit the jackpot. It's going to have to get flushed through a levied system out into a marine environment that is ready for it, that is productive, that is going to allow it to get big and to return as an adult. Whereas this bottom fish, a fish that's almost exactly the same age as that top one, but one that has had access to floodplain-derived food, is not only bigger and healthier, it has the fuel in the tank to weather inevitable tough spots along the way and is much more likely to return from its sojourn at sea as an adult. And Carson, following me, will give some more resolution uh, to that, to that floodplain-derived rearing benefit that means that those fish that get either onto floodplains or can eat from floodplain-derived food, food webs actually come back many more times uh, uh, at, a, at a much higher rate than those do not. The other piece, which I'm not going to get too much time to get into right here, is this sink it, right? And that's, of course, that as water slows across the floodplain, it is also providing an incredible benefit to human settlement in the valley, and that's flood attenuation. When your water is all trapped between those steep levees, right, when it's got no place to go, it comes higher up the levee, and sometimes either that levee breaks or it makes it over the top and spills into Sacramento or Stockton or the little town of Linda. Um, so the multiple benefits are many, but I'm going to focus again on, on energy. And we just know this. It's not just the Sac Valley. Uh, uh, Clern et al. in 2021 did a fantastic paper on the Delta. It's just showing that the same thing. We've lost most of the, the, the floodplain and marshlands in the Delta. And what does that translate to? Well, losing 95% of the, or conversion of 98% of wetlands in the Delta means that you've lost over 90% of the ability of those ecosystems to actually produce biomass. So quantifying that benefit to floodplain rearing for salmon, that's going to be the talk that you can look forward to hear from Carson, uh, I think, immediately following. Uh, are you up next? Two more. Soon, right? But again, the, the, this is the point that I'd like you to, to, to leave with, if there's any. The floodplain's still here. It's, it, it hasn't gone anyway, anywhere. What you're looking at is a fade between modern Google Earth satellite imagery and the 1888 map of the Sacramento Valley, that dark shading there represents the floodplain. And you can see that still. It's like a 5 o'clock shadow that can be seen from space, the ghost of floodplains past, right? The, the, the landscape's still here. What we have is the opportunity to manage with the knowledge of that landscape and natural process. And in so doing, we can recreate ecological function. And there's three main pillars to the, the portfolio of projects that you're going to hear from, from proponents in the Sacramento Valley today, uh, both scientists uh, and, and advocates uh, coming together to, to say, what do we need to do? If we're going to create a valley that works, one where there's more fish, and that's better for everyone, right, as well as more birds and more consistent water supply. Then there's kind of three big buckets we, we might need to focus on on the floodplain. The first one is creation of fish food. The second one I call string of pearls, which is to recognize that there's very little floodplain habitat left within the levees, but what's there is super important. Let's identify it and string it all together. It might not mean much 10 
acres here, 12 acres there, 30 acres there. But if we think big and tie them all together, take each one of those floodplain pearls and string them, we might have something, especially if we dovetail that to the fish food production that happens on the, on the dry side of the, of the levee. And the last is there are still a couple places in the valley where we can go to landscape scale. Why is that so important? Because only at landscape scale do you have any right to expect a population level response. What's that mean? It means we can't nickel and dime this shit. You can't do it. You can't do it 300 acres at a time. You can't do it 1,000 acres at a time. We have to invest at a scale that we have never seen before. That is absolutely necessary. And we can demonstrate success at that scale in the bypasses and at the mouth of Battle Creek in the far uh, upper part of the watershed. Both of those places are landscapes that can be made to function again on a scale uh, sufficient to actually see a population level response. So I'm just going to go really quick through this because you're going you're to uh, hear more about it. But on the wet side of the levee, on, 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 on the river side of, uh, of the levees, uh, we have the idea of the string of pearls, which I just ran down, right? And what's so exciting about that is that our, our mapping and GIS-based modeling tools are finally catching up with our conceptions, with our ideas, with our imagination. And no longer are we simply modeling a broken system. No longer are we simply looking at how a system that is completely cut off the rivers from the floodplain. But we're actually thinking about, yes, this is how it is right now, but how can we alter, modify, change the world that fish actually swim through in such a way that it mimics the way that it was, right? And the ecological floodplain inundation potential modeling tool that has been developed by Seebeck engineers is a fantastic way to actually look at landscape scale, identify each place where if we modified, if we tried to recreate some of the topography that held onto puddles that created wetlands, looks at, at not just the extent, not just the number of acres, but the wetted acre days, the amount of time that that wetland could hold water and uh, occupy, you know, hold fish. All right, so ECOFIP, we have the Nagiri project, which is a similar um, piece. How am I doing on time? Almost done. Two minutes, perfect. Um, so the Nagiri project is a similar project in uh, uh, northern Yolo Bypass, 4,000 acres, uh, managing that footprint to uh, hold on to water not just under major floods, but two, three, four times a year. What that does is creates um, substantially more wetted acre days, substantially more floodplain benefit than... Um, than simply getting it wet. You actually have to keep it wet. So there's a notch going into Yolo Bypass that's a fantastic step forward. That will get water and fish onto Yolo Bypass more frequently uh, than has happened historically when it only happened under very large floods. Um, the notch paired with the Nagiri project, which would hold on and manage that landscape to create ideal wetland habitat, together they create almost 600, uh, I mean almost 700 uh, um, percent more uh, habitat. So landscape scale change that has the potential to actually have a full population level response, right? And this is why we do the whole thing. Oh, can we get that to play real quick? So this is what I'd like to leave you with, right? Is that I believe in these fish. You give them a chance. You give them the slightest chance to, to recognize the world that they evolved in, that they adapted to, and they respond and respond really, really quickly. This is the making of a floodplain fatty, right? It doesn't happen overnight, but it only takes a couple weeks. And if we give the valley the opportunity to reintegrate its engines of natural productivity into the way we manage it, we can really expect an amazing response. The other side of that you'll hear from Jacob Montgomery, which is taking the majority of the formerly activated floodplain that's on the protected side of levees and working with growers and water districts to flood that stuff up 
Even though fish can't get onto that ground, it can still be a really important part of fish recovery by growing the field in those productive wetlands and draining it back through our existing canals back to the river, right? So we're taking things to scale. We're putting the, the energy back into the system. We, we, we are putting the batteries back into the system. And that is the mathematics of recovery. And that's what you're gonna hear about today. So thank you, Puddle Power. Thanks, Jacob, and really pr appreciate that uh, kind of stop motion film of the fish growing. It really does show how it is. It, it also, I think, showed me Thanksgiving week. Uh, <laughs> I think I grew <laughs> like that as well. So, uh, um, but yeah, thank you. And, and thanks. Uh, that's a nice overview of that. And just a, a reminder, we do have a half hour at the end for questions. I know we, we ran out of time here to ask Jacob questions, but there will be an opportunity at the end of the event to do so. And so uh, Jacob was talking about the landscape scale and in doing so, you really need to look at not only the wet side of the levees, as he said, but also uh, the dry side of the levees. And so uh, today uh, we have with us um, Alexandra Wampler and Paul Butner, who are going to be describing the effort that the California Rice Land Salmon Project has been engaged in to look at that dry side. So with that, I'll turn it over to them. Thank you. Well, thank you, Todd. It's a pleasure to be here. Paul Butner with the California Rice Commission to uh, talk about this uh, project we've been working on now for oh five or six years uh, to re re really build on on the good work that you've already heard about uh, the, all that work to understand how fast these fish grow uh, in winter flooded rice fields and so lucky lucky for me I was given a good baseline of of of, of data that was al already developed by UC Davis and Cal Trout and others what this project is about is trying to figure out how we can actually develop a practice around this that growers will actually implement uh, and to document uh, the benefits of that practice. And I'm going to get out of the way pretty quickly and have Alexandra talk about all the great science that's been going on. But this is the product of um, um, uh, uh, support from uh, primarily uh, the Natural Resources Conservation Service. Uh, they're providing about half of the funding, and then there's uh, major donors uh, like state water contractors and Syngenta and many others that, uh, that make this project all possible. And of course, the, then there's the UC Davis team that's listed here that uh, just works tirelessly year after year in getting out there and, and, and doing all the great, great field work. So it really couldn't happen without uh, the funding and, and the great expertise and, and commitment from uh, UC Davis and Caltrout to really uh, help us out on this. Uh, uh, in my former life, I did a lot of bird work for a couple decades for the Rice Commission, right? And and it really wasn't until I was asked to turn my focus uh, onto salmon that it sort of hit me that, wow, you know, what I've really been doing for the last uh, couple of decades is making ground that's already good for wildlife and simply making it better uh, through management. And so um, we, we come into this new idea about applying these principles to uh, salmon recovery, but it comes with uh, decades of experience in doing exactly that uh, for water birds as, as, as as Jacob so eloquently uh, described uh, earlier, so it's a uh, it's been an interesting journey of mine, and so that that's we're we're going to focus mostly on the floodplain rice fields, where I say it's already good habitat, but we can make it a lot better because these salmon are already using uh, those fields. Uh, when uh, the bypass floods, it's sim it, it, it's simply a matter of them not being, in my opinion, optimized for maximum uh, performance as a salmon habitat. And that's what we're getting at here. <clears throat> uh, here's just some great shots of all the uh, incredible science that's been going on out there that Alexandra will talk about in a moment. But, you know, we have fish surgery with JSAT tags being installed and, and uh, all, all, the, uh, all the saning and the counting of, of the fish and, and understanding their growth rates and survivability in field. It's, it's really just been uh, an amazing journey, and everything that we're talking about today can be 
found at a dedicated website, our dedicated website called uh, uh, salmon.calrice.org. Um, so here is uh, the fundamental principle that we're trying to uh, put in place here, and that is here's a typical rice field. This has four checks. Uh, normally, uh, the, the wooden boards in what we call the rice boxes, of course, are solid. Uh, they don't have uh, holes in them. Uh, of course, that prevents water from, a lot of water from leaving the field. This is a winter flooded uh, rice field. And so what we're, what we're trying to uh, examine here in this practice is the idea of making the fields deeper. Uh, a typical winter flooded field that's not in a practice like this would maybe be five to six inches or so deep. We're gonna try to maintain the water at 10 to 12 inches and we're going to uh, provide what we call volitional passage, that is the ability for the fish to leave the fields uh, whenever they want, want to with these uh, holes and notches in every set of boards, including the bottom of the field, where the water will run out continuously during the, um, the habitat season. And if you were a fish, this is what it would look like, right? You go up to this box, and uh, you can swim either through the hole or the notch. We think most of them are swimming through the hole. Uh, and, and water is gently flowing in one direction. As you'll hear, we've already learned that the fish uh, swim in both directions through those holes, including at the, uh, out of the field at will. Um, and uh, really that notch at the top is, it, it also uh, serves as a good compliance feature too, because if we were implementing this in the field, as long as there's water flowing through that two inch notch on a 12 inch stack of boards, then you're at the 10 to 12 inches of depth that we're, uh, we're trying to uh, achieve. Uh, and here are the areas that we'd be talking about. The areas in red are the uh, Sutter and Yolo bypasses, about a potential of 20,000 acres of that rich floodplain habitat that uh, Jacob was talking about. So it's about through management giving it so some of this back of the 95% that's been lost give some of it back uh, through management to these, to these salmon. And then all the green is the rice fields on the dry side of the levee, which you'll hear about a lot in uh, Jacob Montgomery's presentation today. <clears throat> and this is, a, this is a graphic we've developed to sort of show that uh, the rice fields can perform uh, in two different functions. Again, Jacob will focus on this, but on the left, you see a typical year maybe where the bypass doesn't flood. And in that case, uh, you've got the, the, the food-rich flooded rice fields up upper left there um, that can be managed to export that uh, food into the river where the fish are, especially in a year where the bypass doesn't flood. And then you go a little lower, that's depicting when the bypass does flood, then you get, get the fish out on the floodplain, uh, when the bypass floods, that's when they can access the floodplain. So now you've got the fish uh, and the food together um, out in the floodplain fields. And now I'll turn it over to Alexandra to continue the presentation. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here today. Thanks for that wonderful introduction, Paul, to our practice standard. Um, now I'm going to dive into the specifics revolving around the fish. So our study species was the Chinook salmon. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the current state of salmon in the Central Valley and specifically the Sacramento Valley. Um, we have several different runs. We have fall run, late fall, winter, and spring run. And currently the winter and spring run fish are listed as endangered and threatened. So given everything we've learned today, it's pretty clear that we need to find a way to provide more of this floodplain habitat to these endangered and threatened spe species. In my first photos, you can see what the bypass looks like when there are no floods. So during a dry year, such as um, the winter of 2021 and 2022, um, the Sutter Bypass did not become inundated with river waters. Oh, what happened? Sorry. I don't know how to go back. Okay. Anyway, sorry. When we do have a flood, like we did this winter, um, you can see that the canal overtops and fills the whole bypass right up. So this is the Highway 113 bridge here in the lower photo. 
And as you can see, it's water clear across. It's really wonderful. Excellent habitat for our fish. And just for reference, I do have a map here. Um, our study site, the Sutter Bypass, is in that little box. And you can see we're situated about halfway through the Sacramento River. So this project has evolved quite a bit over time, beginning in 2018 and 2019. They started with coded wire tagging fish. So these are tags that we recover from spawning adults, which is very exciting. Um, it has been long enough. We're starting to see some of those adults come back. Um, year two was a smaller scale year where we focused on habitat management techniques such as woody debris, canals, um, basic rice fields, and we learned a lot that way. So we put it to the test and we entered into the full production size rice farms. Um, although in our first year, like I said, we did not have a natural flood. So we stocked the fields with hatchery fish. We were able to monitor their passage behavior through the rice boxes and the modified boards, and we were able to track their outmigration survival. This year was quite a year. Uh, we had a, a nice flood, brought in a ton of naturally recruited fish onto our floodplains, and we were able to not only track in-field behavior, outmigration survival, but we were also able to look at the community assemblage and see which fish were utilizing these rice fields and for how long. So again, just to recenter what every, why we're doing all this and where we're doing it, the Sutter Bypass is just north of the Yolo Bypass, and our study site specifically is on the northern side. So when the bypass fills, the water from the Sacramento River, as you can see there, is just adjacent, fills the bypass. The fish are able to navigate the entire yellow column there, and then they rejoin with the river down at the base, and as you can see, these are two photos of the same position in that corner where the canal meets the bypass. And during a drought year, there's you know tens of feet of clearance. And during a flood year, we had to wait several weeks to get access to this, to get a photo, um, because it was so filled. So like I said before, we focused on rearing our fish in the rice fields compared to rearing them in optimal conditions in the lab. We also took a good look at the community assemblage. So we pulled seine nets through the rice fields themselves periodically throughout our study. And we also had a fike net deployed at the drainage to capture all the fish as they exited the field. Our in-field study with our hatchery fish was primarily focused on their passage behavior around our modified rice boxes. So in this photo here, you can see that I have two white PVC poles on each side of the rice box. Those are pit antennas, so these are just ID readers. As the fish swim through the box, we're able to track how long it took them, how often they were there, um, if they came and went frequently, if they spent a long time near the rice box, and we were able to see their departure on the other side as well. For our out-migration studies, this year we um, stepped it up quite a bit. So we looked at young of the year fish. These are hatchery fish that we obtained as eggs from Coleman National Fish Hatchery. We reared them in the lab, um, and then we deployed some to the rice fields, and we kept some in the lab for the duration of the study. But we also had a group of late fall run yearlings. So just like with the young of the year, we put half of our yearlings in the rice fields, and we kept half of them in the lab. These yearlings, however, were not kept in cages. They were allowed to swim freely throughout the entire rice fields. We were able to track their behavior on our pit detection systems, and we were able to track their exiting of the rice field through our fike net. With our young of the year fish, after they had reached their minimum tagging size, we had a dual side-by-side -side release. So we took some of our rice fish and some of our lab fish, and we released them into the bypass. And then we also took another group of the rice and a group of the lab fish, and we released them in an equal point in the river. So we were able to track their migration, and they started with an equal distance to the ocean. We found a lot of fish with our community assemblage. Um, it was very exciting. The majority, by a great significance, were Chinook salmon. Um, we also had a lot of sunfish, uh, notably, small juveniles. Um, we had a handful of minnows, but it was notable that we had very few predators that were large enough to consume our fry. So as you can see here, we did have a nice big largemouth bass, but our catfish and our centrarchids were generally very small. 
So these are the results. We had nearly 74% of all of the fish we ca captured from natural recruitment were Chinook salmon. Um, so that was really exciting, very encouraging for our study. Um, and then as you can see, we had, we had an interesting group of fishes, um, some you might not expect, some that are completely, totally common. The most important part of our community assemblage study was looking into which specific runs of salmon were utilizing the rice fields. Now the fall run are not currently listed, but they're making their way onto the list. Um, so winter and spring, however, are ESA listed, endangered, and threatened. So it's very important that we be able to provide them the optimal habitat. And as you can see, we did have a good portion of our fish come from those special runs. Um, some interesting results we found that we weren't expecting was we, we did find quite a bit of hybridization. So this orange bar here, the F slash S, those are fall spring hybrids. Um, we had a small handful of fall winter hybrids. Um, and this is very interesting to us. It, we know that this occurs, but we were not expecting it in quite such an abundance. So for our infield passage behavior, we're looking again at how long it takes a fish to pass through the rice box, how many attempts they must make before they successfully pass through, and if they spend any time lingering or avoiding the rice boxes. So these orange boxes on my rice map here are the boxes that we had monitored. Um, due to equipment failure and some other challenges, we weren't able to have complete coverage of the entire field or have every single box monitored, but we did have enough that we were able to get some interesting data. So we found that time of day was a predictor of passage, and we also believe that this may be correlated with temperature. We're still working on these results. Like I said, this was from this year, so it's still very new, um, but we did find a pretty strong correlation here. So for our behavior, we classified the fish into three groups, fast exiters, residents, and highly active residents. So fast exiters are the fish where once we released them into the rice field, they booked it on out to the drain right away. Residents, however, did the opposite, right? So we released them into the rice field, and they stayed in the plot that we released them in, and they did not show many movement attempts um, in any direction. Then we have our highly active residents. So these are fish that stayed within the rice field for the duration of the study, but they were busy, and they moved back and forth between rice boxes across different plots, and even near the drain without actually exiting. However, fish don't line up into the conformity we like to put them in, so most of our fish could not be classified so simply. Our outmigration survival was excellent this year. I'm very excited to show you that, but I'll take a step back and explain what we did first. So the map shows our release site in the Sutter Bypass all the way to the Pacific Ocean at the Golden Gate Bridge. The little green dots are my receiver detection positions. So those are all the points where I can detect a fish. And as I mentioned before, we had two rearing groups, floodplains and lab, and we also had two life stages, the yearlings and the young of the year. Um, we, and then we also did the release in three groups, volitional, they had the ability to begin their migration at any point during the study, whereas the Sacramento River and the Sutter Bypass Young of the Year release was controlled, and we released them into an actively flooded bypass. So very similar to how they would be naturally found on the bypass. First year, the drought year, where we didn't have any naturally recruited fishes, we still did our migration study to see what it would look like in considerably poor conditions. And we did find that the rice fish survived slightly better than the lab fish. Um, even though it's only a slight difference in the trend, it was consistent all the way to the delta. Um, and looking at our overall survival, you'll see this big drop initially. That's pretty consistent with other telemetry studies and release studies. Um, and then the most important part is after this, after the big drop, that's really the bypass right there. And we can see that there's slight plateau, but still a pretty good drop. Um, the rest of it is totally consistent with other studies throughout the Sacramento River. We had overall 3% survival to the ocean, which is on the higher end of expected. 
This year, however, these are very preliminary results, so um, please bear with me. I do not have um, nearly half of my receivers back yet, but I was able to put together the overall survival of all of our fish. So we had almost 700 fish to begin with, and as you can see, we still had that initial drop as expected, but it's much, much smaller, and we had overall excellent survival through the bypass. Um, and then, as comes with wet years, we had pretty nice survival throughout the river and the delta as well, and we ended up with 15% of our fish surviving to the Golden Gate Bridge, which is except exceptional. We were very excited for that. So going forward, we're really looking, f looking into getting more of these rice farmers in flood zones, implementing our practice standard, and seeing what that looks like on a large scale. So next year, we're going to have our practice standard on three separate production size rice farms within the Sutter Bypass. We're going to continue to monitor the community assemblage by pulling seines and having fikes deployed at the drainage of each field. And we're also going to increase our efforts to observe predators. So we're going to increase our pred predator surveys by using hook and line and some traps. But of course, the most important part of these rice fields is making sure that they're suitable habitat for our fishes. So we will be constantly monitoring the oxygen and the dissolved the dissolved oxygen and the temperature um, through both autonomous loggers, which stay in the field and we go out and download every few days, but we'll also have real-time monitors, which upload the data to the internet and we're able to see it right away. We don't have to drive out there and we can keep a good eye on our fish. So with that, I'm very excited to see more farms get, getting into this and seeing how we can improve our overall management of our resources. And I'd like to thank everybody on the team at UC Davis. Um, it was a huge effort over the several years, and we couldn't have done it without any of our funders and collaborators. We work very closely with NOAA, um, NRCS, Caltrout, the California Rice Commission, CDFW, and of course, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife. And if you have any more questions, please see the website at salmon.calrice.org. Do we have any questions? Great. We have about five minutes for questions. Are there any in the room? Oh. Hi. Um, just a quick question for you. I have my own suspicions, but I wonder what you're thinking led to the higher survivorship um, in those wet years and in those drier years, did they have to pass through notches that they didn't have to in the wet years? Yes, that's an excellent point. Um, I don't want to make any claims that I, I can't commit to, but it, it, we do always see greater survival during wet years. Um, the amount of water in the system is very important. Access to habitats and corridors is very important. And when we have drought years, we do have a lot of restricted access um, and reduced flow levels which also increases temperature, um, and it's kind of this sl slippery slope um, for the drought years. And we think that when, when it's wet, everything does better, and we, al we, we always expect to see better survival. Oh, I just had a question. On one of your slides, you showed run type. Uh, yeah. How were you able to determine the run type? We used genetic analysis okay. of tissue samples. All right, thanks. So when you talked about the survival of the release studies, it, you didn't separate the lab fish from the, the field reared fish, or at least I didn't notice the results from the two. Was there a difference between the two? Right, so for the first year, the drought year, um, we did get that separation data, um, but I, I have not received enough of my data back from this year, um, so we still have our acoustic receivers out there. We're still waiting to get that data back before we can distinguish between which groups. But we did separate them both for compar comparison, the lab. Yes, we will be able to do that. We will do that soon. As soon as we get the data back, we will be looking into um, which groups survived better. We'll be looking across the um, beginning date of their migration, um, so we'll be looking at those volitionally released fish as well as the ones that we released um, 
all at once and we'll be looking at the different rearing conditions and the different release locations to see if there are any correlations or any significant factors that stand out. Right, we, and we had a couple of questions that came in online. Um, uh, Jeff Jenkins with DWR asks, when utilizing managed rice fields as floodplains and rearing habitat for ju juvenile salmonids, what thought has been given to predator deterrence? How will managers deal with, oh boy, this is a big word, piscivorous birds, you can tell I'm not a scientist here, and other predators of small fish, especially in drier years when these puddles may be few and far between concentrating birds to the managed fields. Right. I don't want to speak over other folks that might um, also be able to answer this question as far as the birds are concerned. Um, in our large scale experiments, we have not seen bird predation. We do have game cameras out and monitoring. Um, we can see that the birds are there, but we have seen minimal and insignificant amounts of um, bird predation and we're able to monitor this through our hatchery fish that we release into the field and we're able to capture them at the end of the season so we're able to see what the infield survival is and we've determined that the predation is minimal. Great thanks and one more online was uh, from Alex Beeks. Has there been any measurement of how the increased flooding in rice fields with the purpose of food web production and fish rearing affects nutrient availability in the following crop year. I'm interested if that practice is or could be mutually beneficial. Yes, okay, do you wanna, do you wanna answer it? Well, I don't know a lot of the okay. details. Okay, I can, okay. I can try. Okay. <laughs> so we are looking into that. Um, fish water or the, the water that fish live in is in aquariums or in ta tanks anywhere is known to be excellent source of nutrients and really improve plant health um, across a ver various species of plants. So there are currently studies going on that, will, that are determining exactly how beneficial this fish water is for the crops. Thank you. Great, so uh, next up, uh, we're talking about uh, the salmon getting out on the landscape and just how important that is. Uh, Carson Jeffries from UC Davis is going to be talking about how they're utilizing the salmon eye lenses and otoliths to determine habitat. So Carson, thank you so much. I like the big green button on there. You can tell I'm not, I'm gonna try not to screw this up too much. <clears throat> All right, well, this is awesome. I feel like these are all my all my people talking about the things that I love most are fish and floodplains. So this is pretty awesome to see. Um, it was funny when Jacob was giving his talk. I was like, God, Jacob's really talking for a long time for twenty minutes. And then I looked at the schedule and I said, Wow, I have thirty minutes. <laughs> so you guys get a little extra time of me thinking. And uh, I also want to just uh, you know thank Alex for everything that she did this last year and Paul for making that stuff happen. I, it, so much work goes into what Alex just presented. I think it's hard to appreciate what that what that was and understanding what that looks like in a in a wet year and chasing fish around and understanding how they're moving around. And <clears throat> I think it's also worth noting with what Alex talked about is the question about predators on the landscape, particularly in these habitats. Is that when the water is spread out, there's fish everywhere. There's predators in other places. There's salmon everywhere. I think it's really cool to see that we saw almost 70-plus seven, percent salmon were the fish that were recruited into these habitats. Of course there are fish. There are predators all throughout the landscape. But the thing I want that I think is worth thinking about to the question is that when we don't have those habitats flooded, all of those same fish and predators are just in that narrow canal that is draining out of the system. So as opposed to diffusing our predation across the landscape, we're narrowing and concentrating our predator prey interactions for our salmon. I think that that's just a really important thing to think about when we think about how these landscapes are actually being used, that when the water is actually spread across is we're diffusing our predators across the system along with our prey in these productive habitats and just realizing the benefits of that. And I think it's a, in, in that kind of line of thought, sorry, you guys get my extra time and my extra thinking since I have 10 extra minutes. Um, 
is when we were showing some of these data earlier in the year, we had a question of like, well, how can you compare the fish that are out there to a control group that isn't being, where the water isn't being held back? I said, well, it's really simple because there's no water on the field next to it that was just drained off without any control structures on it. And I think that that is the fundamental importance of thinking about how these fields are managed is that when we do slow the draining, is what we're functionally doing, as Jacob talked about it earlier, is that you know, these fields are graded to drain. And when we see a flood event that doesn't have anything to hold the water back, it just drains off right away. And the fish may be out there, but they're only out there for a few days before they come back off. And so by actually holding the water back there and slowing that draining down is that food web that Jacob talked about and that process is able to be realized. I think that that's just a real important thing to consider is that the control is zero is that when you look at the adjacent field that's not being managed, there aren't fish there, and we know that that's not habitat. And so it's, it's just an important thing to think about when we're making these management decisions and seeing this across the landscape is that we're creating opportunities for growth. Yeah, there might be predation out there. There might be birds. There might be fish. But you know what? All those same things are happening in those narrow channels that are next to this system as well. And I think it's hard to see that because we can't see that. When we look into the river, you don't look in and see predators but you do see this narrow thing without a lot of habitat. I think that just when we're comparing our control, what we think of as our control for whatever um, <clears throat> sort of the uh, work that we're doing is I think it's important to consider what that control actually means. And it's hard to quantify, but I think it's important to conceptualize that. And so now I'll actually get to my talk. Um, so thank you, Alex and Paul, for setting that up. And thanks, Jacob, as well. Um, one of the big challenges we have in floodplains is understanding how their benefit is realized over time. When most of these fish enter these habitats, is they're too small to tag, they're from wild recruits, and they go out there, we don't really see them again, and, and we hope, we know that there's a lot of food. We know that growth rates are high out there from these opportunities from like work we've done on the Nagiri Project and NAGS for the years, work that Alex has done when we see fish that are recruited in these habitats, we see how quickly they grow, there's a lot of food. There's lots of work, and we can say, I think, pretty confidently that when fish have access to these habitats, the growth rates are really high, it's really impressive, and I, I, I think that that's no longer a mystery, and I think that we see that across the landscape. But the big question is, how do we get this translation from that couple weeks of that fish's life in that habitat to those that are ultimately recruited into adulthood? And really, up until a couple of years ago, that was a really tough question to ask. And as we, you know, we see this here, as I, I like to think of this as the transition from the juvenile to the adult, is being recorded in various structures in these fish. In that we are able to, with the kind of development of the isotopes, stable isotopes in islands, is, is that we've been able to tell the story of those fish, that we're able to utilize those habitats and quantify what that is and then seed that recruitment into adulthood. Because we're ultimately needing to quantify and measure the benefits of the actions that we're making across the landscape. Is that it's really hard to ask for hundreds of millions of dollars and say, well, we think it's gonna be a pretty good idea. We know that this works. And I, I know at that first part of the life stage, we know that it works. Like there's, I think there's very little question about the benefits of off-channel habitats from a food web perspective and a growth rate perspective for these fish. But does that translate into the fish that we count? And those fish that we count are the adults that are caught in the fishery or that come back as adults and are recounted on carcass surveys in the rivers and spawning and return to the hatcheries. <clears throat> and so that was where we started down this path, is to work on quantifying the benefits of these habitats. And with that, I'll try and tell a little story about how we use these, what I think of as a diet journal in these fishes as being recorded in the islands of them. And why that's important is that there's this idea of nursery habitats. And that a nursery habitat is a habitat that disproportionately recruits into adulthood. And I think that we can say pretty confidently that these habitats, these floodplain habitats, are really beneficial to fish in their juvenile stage. We know that they grow well. We know they're very productive. But how can we quantify their disproportionate benefit into adulthood. We use this idea of, um, I think the idea of a nursery habitat is really important. Salmon live this life cycle that at any one of these points, you could have a broken chain in this cycle. Whether if you don't have spawning habitat, you don't have juveniles, you don't see recruitments that come back as adults. 
if you have spawning habitat, you don't have rearing habitat, it's broken. You know, so what we need to do is understand this whole life cycle of the things that we can understand and that we can control. And really that's on the freshwater side. The ocean is a big place. We don't really have a lot of control over the ocean. The only thing that we do over the ocean is control fishery and harvest. And the reality of the situation is that probably doesn't have a gigantic impact on what is ultimately come back. And I think we're seeing that this year is that, you know, with the closure of the commercial and recreational fishery is we're still seeing very few fish coming back to particularly the Sacramento Basin. We're seeing it in the McCallamy and some in the American feather, but really the sack is really being hurt. And so understanding what our limiting factors are and what is recruiting into adulthood is really important. And so I'm going to try and, and tell this story from the work that we're doing and developing, the tools that we're developing, and understanding the life, the freshwater life cycle of these fish and how they can, um, different habitats are disproportionately recruiting into adulthood. And to tell that story is really started with Miranda uh, Tilcock up on the top there. And if anybody has time, she was on Science Friday and does the best job. I will not do as good of a job as she does describing what I'm going to talk about. So um, if you have a few minutes, seeing the world through a salmon's eyes is a good listen. It's 10 minutes. It's worth your time. And she got to be on Science Friday. When I remember when that Science Friday reached out to her and she reached out to me and was like, I got this thing from these people at a program called Science Friday. I was like, God, that is like... <laughs> my life dream, and, and you don't even know who's calling. Um, um, but she did a wonderful job. She got a cup from Ira Flato. Um, it's very impressive. We're very proud of her. Um, but the reason why this thing works is that we have a fundamental isoscape. And by isoscape, I mean that we have different isotopes of sulfur across the landscape in different habitats. And you can kind of see a rough gradient here of what happens is that we are really lucky in that <clears throat> anybody who's walked in a wetland or a floodplain, you smell the, that rotten egg smell when you're in the mud, right? And what that is, is that is sulfur-reducing bacteria that are in the mud, that are in the anoxic zone, so they're in the sediment where there's no oxygen, and they're changing the isotopic concentration of sulfur in that habitat. And the beauty of sulfur is it doesn't fractionate. So as soon as those microbes change it, is it doesn't change as it moves up the food web. So it works as a really good fingerprint for the habitat of that spot. And so if we know that there's a gradient there from different habitats, we go and look in the stomach contents of fish, and we're like, holy moly, look at that. The river's in one spot, the floodplain's in another. We can use sulfur as an isotopic fingerprint for these different habitats and we're lucky enough that these beautiful islands, this is an islands of a salmon that you can see here. And what happens is that they grow over time like an onion. And we were super lucky. This is when it's just better to be lucky than good in life, is that you can see these S's that I have circled up here, is that both cysteine and methionine are amino acids that have a sulfur group on them. And there is a lot of sulfur in those two amino acids. And it turns out that those two amino acids are the dominant amino acids that are part of the crystalline of the islands that is formed. And so we don't need a lot of material. We can look at the individual layers in the middle there of juvenile salmon islands and tell which habitat it was ultimately um, feeding in when that islands layer was formed. So just kind of, again, looking at the islands, it's like an onion. We go and collect um, the islands after the fish die. So this is the beauty of it also. Is you, don't ha you can let the fish do its whole thing and then we have, this is where you know who your friends really are. When you call the carcass surveys and you say, hey, I know you guys are out there chopping fish in half with a machete. It's pretty gruesome. Can you also collect the eye lenses and the otoliths out of these fish so that we can tell their story a little more and understand who these fish are and where they've been? Um, we've bought a lot of pizza for people. Um, and it's, it's really important. We're really appreciative of, of both CDFW and Fish and Wildlife Service in the Upper Sacramento and Butte Creek and lots of other systems that we're working in, and we, we really appreciate them. But the reason why that is important is that when we go and reconstruct uh, the eye lens layers of fish, this is just a conceptual model of what the wet might look like, is we have the middle part is, is mom. That's, that's the signature of mom, and we know what that is because as a fish is you know, using that yolk, salmon have a really big yolk for a fish. And so that it, provides, it provides them with a lot of nutrients to get those first couple layers. And so we have mom's signature, which is really a marine signature. It looks just like the ocean. And then we start seeing diversification in who they are. 
is that fish can either be in the river, they can be in the river feeding on floodplain food, they can be in the floodplain. We can't really distinguish between a fish that's in the river feeding on floodplain food and a fish that's in the floodplain feeding on floodplain food. Those are kind of the same. We're working on some tools for that now. I'll talk a little bit about that at the end. But what we do is we go get these adults. We peel each of those individual layers off underneath the microscope. We, we, magic happens. We send them to this machine, and we get data back. And it's pretty cool. Um, and so to tell this story, I'm going to just focus in on the winter run. And so the winter run are endangered. You know, they're one of our critters that, I'm, yeah, I've been around Jacob for too long. I'm using critters now. Um, they're one of our critters that is really a large driver for so much of the management of the system. Um, just because they are endangered. You know, really, spring run are, are our next fish that has joined this unfortunate list. Is that with the uplist of spring run, is they're probably going to deal with some of the things. I don't want to say I was fortunate that we were able to sample spring run juveniles last year. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that. But I think that with these limitations, you'll see that for the winter run is we can only tell the adult story. And we can only tell the adult story for the survivors because we can't actually sample the juveniles for good reason. You know, there's only a few of them. But as we kind of come closer to the precipice of endangered extinction listings is that our ability to sample these fish become more and more limited. And some of the tools that this, you know, although it's only looking at the adults, um, it's something that I think is going to be super useful. I'm going to blow through this pretty quickly because I think we've seen this before. It's, you know, our system has fundamentally changed. We've gone from, you know, abundant wetlands to just, you know, a smattering across the landscape, understanding how that works in different water years, and how water interacts with these habitats is also critically important. And that when we first started this, we looked at 16, 17, and 18 out migration years. 16 was below normal, 17 was wet, 18 was below normal, but they also have different timing of, even a below normal year sees flooding. And I think Jacob talked about this earlier in the, about the Kasumnas, is we've been working on the Kasumnas for 25 years now. And what's crazy is every year of the previous decade of droughts, the Kasumnas floods. And what it is is that threshold is lower. And that in the Sacramento system, because we have these flood weirs that are high up, is it the, the threshold to get water onto the floodplain is really high. And so to meet that, it takes more and more water to do that. And I just think when we look at these natural systems where the thresholds are reduced is our frequency of inundation ends up being a lot higher and is worth considering how frequently we see it. So what you see here is the hydrology in the Sacramento River. And then we look at, this is the amount of habitat that is inundated, or the amount of time that is inundated during um, that's those same years and looking at just Sutter Bypass. And then if you go to the blue, this is Yolo Bypass. And so you can see that each of those thresholds is higher. So we saw our hydrograph from what it looked like before, just in the Sacramento. Then we see the blue, which is the Sutter Bypass, which you see compared to Yolo is much higher. Fortunately, I think that's going to change now that we have this new big thing happening up on Yolo, which I'm sure everybody here is very aware of. Um, but the idea is that we change that to where we see that inundation more frequently. It's not just these really large events that are very short in duration, but taking advantage of these smaller events and increasing the duration is something that if we want to see these processes and see them recorded in the fish is really important. So we we wanted to look at not only the time of duration, but the area of inundation that we're seeing as well. And so if you look on the figure on the left here, this is a rating curve that we put together using Verona. And so at the bottom, you can see that there's just a little bit of water on the landscape on the um, top there. As we start moving up, the water gets higher. You see the landscape start becoming more and more inundated. Yolo starts spilling. So you can see that when Yolo starts spilling, we get a fair bit of water on Yolo, but Sutter is already completely full. And then by the time we get to about 80,000 CFS in Verona, you can see that water is on the landscape. If you look at the satellite imagery, it's not just within the bypasses, but we've seen enough water falling that even the dry sides of the levee, all the fields are full. And you know, just thinking about what that would look like historically, Jacob showed the, the flood basins before. And think about those flow events. 80,000 CFS at Verona is not a lot of water compared to what we used to see. But just understand that even 80,000 at Verona is we have a wet system, and the system is completely full for all the habitat that we really have available. But why is that important? And so now I told you where we're at. I told you when it gets wet, we see these differences in the landscape that's available. 
And then how does that translate to the fish that are ultimately coming back as adults? So these are juvenile time frames. This is the diameter of the inner part of the lens, and these are sulfur isotopes. And that the sulfur isotope at roughly five parts per mil is the unit that we, you just, at roughly five on here, is that below five is roughly the signature of a floodplain. Above five is a signature that is in the river from the riverine food web. And one of the things that you can see is that when we start looking at the adults that are coming back, is it was a little scary to realize how important the floodplain resources are for the fish that are coming back. You can see almost all of these fish that come back to spawn as adults use floodplain during their juvenile time frame. That's a big, important thing. And I think it's hard to stress the, that importance. And the beauty of the winter run, when we first did this, the beauty of the winter run is that they are 100% marked. I know that's not the beauty, um, but it is one of the things that we know, is we know that that's not, a hab that's not a hatchery signature that we're seeing on there. These are actual riverine versus non-riverine food webs that we're seeing being recorded into the eye lenses of these fish. And so when we look at that from a percentage standpoint, is holy moly, this is a big deal. Is we see about... 80% of the fish that came back that immigrate that came back in 18, 19, and 20, so these are fish that left in 16, 17, and 18, come back. And then what's crazy is that the, the, 20, the, the adults that came back in 20 that were left in 2018 didn't have a lot of floodplain available. It wasn't a wet year. It was a relatively dry year. And that we really scratched our head on that is because when we looked at this, I have that here, um, is you can see that when that juvenile outmigration period didn't correspond to the main flood period that we saw in 2018. It still flooded in 2018, but it was later in the system, or later in the year, and we, we were really working on trying to figure out why those fish are coming back. Particularly, you would think that our, our hypothesis was that we would see much fewer fish that had floodplain signatures during the 2018 outmigration, the 2020 adult returns. And so then we started... Sulfur isn't the only thing that's on the landscape, it turns out. You know, we are actually looking at carbon, nitrogen, and sulfur. And what ended up being really cool is that when you plot them together on a three-dimensional graph here, you can see sulfur on the, on the z-axis, uh, carbon on the, on the bottom, and then nitrogen on the going back into the board, theoretically, is that when we put all three isotopes together from different habitats, we're like, holy moly, we can actually start to see specific floodplains in three-dimensional space using carbon, nitrogen, and sulfur. And I, I, I have been fighting this figure for like two months. I can't get the program to make the circle around the American River, so I apologize. <laughs> um, <laughs> it, is, it is really making me crazy, and I can't understand why. Um, I love R, but there's certain things that make me crazy. Um, but what was interesting is that when I took those, those 2018 fish that I showed you, and I didn't just look at their sulfur, but I look at their carbon and their nitrogen and their sulfur, is they fall out in the lower American River. And 10 minutes. And so um, it made me really question some of the things we're doing. And it didn't make me question whether this was you know, a tool that was useful, but it made me a question for thinking about what fish we see have opportunities in different habitats and how that's realized into recruitment. And so I went through the satellite imagery, and I looked through the lower American River, and I was like, holy moly, this is crazy. And the thing that I realized, there's a couple things that happen here. One is we're tidal at this point. So it doesn't take a lot of water to actually back it up into the lower American floodway here on the bottom. You also have this big drain that comes out of uh, the urban Sacramento, which is, I think, why we end up with a really funky signature, I think, and why it stands out so uniquely, I shall say. Um, and then we have the American here. And so when we started looking through, is, it is... It, is always, it floods almost all the time. So when I showed the YOLO and the American, or the YOLO and the Sutter bypasses, is their threshold, remember I talked about their thresholds being really big because they have these crested weirs that the water has to get over. But the American actually backs up into here quite frequently. And this, if you look in this area, in this lower American river, is it floods all the time. And it's a giant floodplain. I buy giant floodplain. I'm talking tens of acres, maybe 100 acres. Um, but it's always there. And when we went through Corey Phyllis's work at MET, looking at otolith reconstruction of winter run that were coming back as well, 
is he found a high percentage of winter run in their otoliths were spending a significant amount of time in the American as well. So I think that there's all, Jacob talked about the string of pearls. But I think at the same point, in, in those dry years, those strings of pearls are becoming increasingly reliant on these postage stamps that are in the system. And that it's not the big, it's not the big floodplains that are helping hold up the system, but it's these small things. But I think it's also, it's these small ones that are just barely helping them hold on. And I think that, you know, giving ourselves a pat on the back for a couple hundred acres in the low American is not necessarily what I want to do. Is that, you know, this is kind of something that we accidentally let happen. And it is barely holding up that population. It's not like Winter Run are doing great. And what we need are more of these systems and more access to floodplain throughout the system to where we can see those same benefits realized. And when we want to look at this from a whole life stage perspective, is I can go into some of the, winter, some of the fall run stuff here. And I put juveniles, and I put an asterisk up there, because these are only fall run size juveniles in the system. Is that because we're only able to sample fall run because of permitting, is I think we're missing out on some of those fish that grow into the spring run. When we actually look at the, so when we look at the genetics of the spring run size fish during a wet year, they're almost all fall run. And how do you grow a fall run into a spring run? You give it access to good growth conditions on the floodplain or with floodplain food. It's interesting, when we see these fish that are in the river that aren't growing, like you can tell those fish in the river that aren't growing. Jacob showed a picture of it earlier with that small fish and the big fish, is that those, those fall run fish that are in the river that aren't growing look like fall run fish on the length of date scale. Those big fish that you collect in the spring, there's not a lot of spring run fish in the system, but it's amazing how many spring run fish we get in a wet year. They're not actually spring run. They're just fall run that have grown into their, be the size of their big brothers uh, and sisters. But what we see is that when we look at those fish is that for 2016 and 17, about 15% and 20% of the juveniles had floodplain flood plain signature in their eye lenses. But when we match those cohorts to come back two years later, as you can see, about 50% and 75% of those fish that come back two years later are floodplain users. And that we're seeing that disproportionate recruitment into adulthood from specific habitats. And this is that idea of the nursery concept, is that when we are able to quantify those habitats through the life stage of fish to recruit as adult, and recruit into adulthood, is we're able to get that. And so we just got our spring run size fish where we're, we're doing the same thing. We actually take the otoliths out. We, we assign them to all their different watersheds. We can see who, there are, who they are, which opportunities they have to access floodplains and different migratory pathways. We'll assign them out, and then we'll look at these isotopes in their eye lenses. And then for each of those different populations, we'll be able to see that, that differential recruitment from juvenile to adulthood. Well, DWR, has, we're just in contracting now to get that forward, so thank you, DWR. Um, we have multiple cohorts of fish to start looking at these, not just the fall run sized fish, but what are the actually realized populations that are utilizing these habitats and how those are differentially recruiting into adulthood and being able to quantify the benefits to the actions we're making. I mean, we're spending a lot of time and effort doing things and studying things. And it, it's time to start like, you know, we're seeing big actions start to happen. We're seeing the notch in YOLO. We're gonna see a fundamentally different opportunity to, to manage YOLO. We see Paul's program on Sutter, where we have, we're no longer managing you know, these 10 acres that flood during a natural flood event and then just drain right back off again. We're seeing hundreds of acres that are being utilized in these programs that have the benefits. And you know, thinking about what the alternative is, the control is zero. And so we know that fish are being recruited out there. We know that they're growing quickly. And just those programs are so important for ultimately seeing this life cycle be realized. And so we're continuing to build out this uh, cohorts over time because I think, you know, being able to see how different water years recruit differentially from different populations. We're working with uh, um, DJFMP data to look at how different water years are recruiting, not only just from different sizes and different isotopes, but looking at how the adult to recruit, the adult to smolt to adult again. So you know, looking at the full life stage of these fish recruited through this, the whole system is gonna be really important. And using the eyes and the otoliths are gonna be critical of that. Um, building out the isoscape, I showed just some of the habitats that we're seeing there in that three-dimensional space. 
um, you know, we are, we are continuing to build that out so we can start to identify specific floodplains. You know, are we going to be able to continue to see enough differentiation in isotopic signatures between the different floodplains to see that data? And that's, you know, part of that is expanding our, our sampling. And, and lots of our partners at CDFW and Fish and Wildlife Service have been super helpful in helping that out. So we are, we are really expanding that out in this next phase of the project is to really diversify our, our, our portfolio of fish and try and understand the portfolio of options that they have. And there's been a lot of people who have been part of this. Um, obviously, state water contractors, Prop 1 at CDFW, and, and the Met have really helped keep this floated by, you know, all of our carcass crews. Um, this is, these are the people who, you know, we need to buy beer and pizza for because it is gruesome. I, I will say that it's one thing to take, a car, take an eyeball out of a fresh carcass, but when you have a carcass that you're fighting the vultures for, you know, it's, we're very appreciative. Um, <laughs> And you know we have team eyes and team ears and stuff and all these people. So I think with that, um, I think I'm about on time. Yeah. Great, thanks, Carson. We've got a couple of minutes here. Is there a question in the room for Carson? Oh. Yeah, thanks, Carson. Uh, David Guy, Northern California Water. Uh, yeah, Carson, thanks, as always, for, for all the great insights and work. Um, are you seeing skepticism or any kind of negativity towards any of the work that you and Rachel are doing? Or, and if so, could you kind of describe where that's coming from and how, as a scientific community, we can kind of learn from that and work through that? I mean, there's always skeptics. I mean, I think that skepticism is good. I think it makes you think about what... Um, you know, what you're doing and ways you can get after it. I don't think it's all justified, and I would disagree with some of it, and I have disagreed with some of it. Um, you know, I think that, especially with something that's new, is that I, you know, this has been around for a handful of years, and we have learned so much in the last five years of doing this that, you know, our original, pre, our original notions of as we learn from this have changed as well. And I think that skepticism and evolution of science is a process. And, you know, we are working on, you know, there's certain things that the beauty of isotopes is they're bound in physics in that that's one of the things I think really gives us a leg to stand on here is that physics are, you know, they, they stay within the, within the rules. And so we are working on kind of building out the foundation of the physics to justify this life cycle. So a short story. They just don't think it's a signature for off-channel habitat or that there must be some other thing in there. We, I, I mean, we've looked around. We sample lots of the riverine food webs. Um, I don't see it anywhere. We, we see a very strong signature difference between the riverine food webs and the non on the off-channel's habitats. And, and, and the reason why is that because to get reduced sulfur, you have to have an anoxic interface with the, at the substrate level. Rivers don't see that anoxic substrate and because there's not enough carbon in the substrate, and the river's moving too fast. And so we actually don't see that boundary layer of anoxics locations to reduce the sulfur. And so, you know, like I said, to smell that rotten egg smell on a floodplain or a wetland, that is reduced sulfur, and you don't get that in a river. You might get it in small little pockets. I mean, maybe there are little pockets within rivers that you might get that. But with our rivers that are going up and down, it's oftentimes flush so much without enough um, without enough water to actually stay there for a long time. It, it just doesn't really happen in, in our sites. Um, we're out of time. We'll do uh, at the end of the presentation. So hopefully you can remember it. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm glad to hear I'm not the only NPR junkie in the room here. I, actually, I imagine in this crowd there's probably quite a few. So <laughs> what, what an awesome opportunity to be on Science Friday. Um, so uh, next up, we're moving along here. We have Jacob Montgomery, who's with uh, Caltrout, and he's going to be talking about the fish food program and really looking at that dry side of the levee and, and the opportunity there. Uh, and so with that, I will turn it over to Jacob. So thank you, Jacob. Thanks, Todd. Um, I start this off here. You guys have my presentation up? 
Okay. <laughs> that was too quick. There we go. Um, okay, so yeah, the fish food program is sort of our complement to all of these wet side, um, you know, flood fish habitat programs. And it can be really powerful. And we've been working on this for the last few years. So I'm going to give you an, an overview on how it works, uh, some of the science that we are doing um, to kind of prove it out and sort of where we see it going um, in the future. And like we've seen before, I'm going to kind of breeze through this, but you know, all the work that we're doing in the Central Valley region at Cow Trout is based on the theme here that given equal opportunities in time, you know, during the, the winter and spring months, juvenile salmon and a lot of native fish, uh, for that matter, grow a heck of a lot better on floodplains than they do in any other habitat that they have access to in the valley. Um, and that's because of a, a few different reasons and probably combinations of those. One of the main ones is is the food that's out there on the floodplain. And since we're talking fish food, not just fish, we're gonna dive into the food a little bit here. It's not just the abundance of the food, which is significant, right? You know, Jake was talking about a hundred or fifteen thousand percent increase in food relative to these other habitats. It's also very specific differences in the flavors of food that are out there, right? So these are a couple examples of the types of zooplankton uh, critters that are out in the aquatic ecosystem, um, both in floodplains and in rivers and canals. These two on the far left, those are copepods. They grow pretty much everywhere. Um, these three on the bottom here, these are what I would call small cladocerans. Uh, cladocerans is like a technical term. There's a lot of, these two big ones are cladocerans too. A lot of people call them water fleas. Um, more commonly. These small ones also grow just about everywhere in, in rivers and um, in, in canals and it's because they have adaptations to kind of cling on to pieces of structure, right? They don't really like flow but these small ones can hang on to some veg or hang on to some rocks. These big ones are floodplain specialists. Um, they only grow in really slow water and that's because they can't move very fast. They, they need a really slow system to, to just exist, right? They, they're they huge. They just kind of float around like a little jellyfish almost and bob through the water. They get really big. They, they have a life history where they can reproduce incredibly fast. And in a floodplain, they, they create this massive abundance that you just don't see in these other species of bugs. Um, so in addition to their abundance and their behavior that basically swimming really slowly and being very, very big, um, they are a, a hugely beneficial food item for fish that grows exclusively on floodplains and in other kind of slow moving backwater wetland type habitat. Um, and so these bugs, in addition to their abundance, are, are really the reason why our fish grow so well in floodplains. Um, and again, we've seen this before, um, you know, in a pre-development California or, you know, Sacramento Valley is, we've cut off the map here. Um, you had all this gray shaded region on either side of the river is permanent wetlands. So you had extensive floodplain, both just existence, but also uh, connectivity. Every, every time you would have rain events and snowmelt events, the Sacramento River would spill into these wetlands. Fish would go with that. They would get access to all of this habitat and food. And, um, and all of our native fish are adapted to this process on the landscape that we just don't have anymore, right? We've got dams on all of our major rivers that, that mute that flood signal from, from flowing down into the lower part of the valley. And we've got levees on both sides of the river that prevent the river from spilling out just anywhere. It does spill out in a couple of key places, right? So this gold area is the Sutter Bypass. The purple area is the Yolo Bypass. These are the last major remaining um, pieces of habitat that fish can access under the right conditions. But as you know, previous talks have talked about that the the threshold for activating those habitats and giving fish access to them is pretty high. Um, but that's really all that's left, at least that we have access to right now. So the, all of this green shaded region is, uh, is agriculture and some of the more lime green is, is wildlife refuges. That's all still floodplain. It all still works it's very similar to how the historical floodplain worked as far as the aquatic ecosystem processes and growing those bugs that we talked about before. Um, but the trick is that fish don't have access to it. And so our job as we see it at Caltrout is kind of twofold, at least in the Central Valley region. One is increasing fish access to existing floodplains, but also bringing the floodplains that fish don't have access to back to the fish. And we, we do that 
in um, what we colloquially call our, our dry side and our wet side programs. And so I'm going to focus on the fish food, which is a, we call the dry side program. Um, wet side is basically what you've heard about already. Um, this is anywhere where uh, the river floods and inundates a bypass. This photo here is the Fremont Weir before the notch went in. Um, and uh, you know when this happens, fish come with that water and they get into this flood habitat and they have all the opportunities that we really want them to have as far as a, a healthy, native, uh, adapted California floodplain species. Um, the dry side programs are, this is a picture of the RD-108 um, rough and ready pumps is their major flood infrastructure that, that exports water from their basin into the Sacramento River. And that water is, is full of those um, floodplain adapted zooplankton. And so the dry side programs are really about integrating the, all the floodplain that's left over um, you know, when, you, when you remove um, the, uh, the quality of fish access, right? So, so fish can't get to these um, floodplains, but they're still there, they're still functioning, they still produce food. How do we get the energy produced in those floodplains back to the fish? And we do it with infrastructure like this. Um, and so, yeah, real briefly, you, you know, YOLO bypass, Sutter bypass, um, all of these programs basically are about increasing the frequency of floodplain activity and the, uh, the duration of those flood events. And so that's with programs like Paul's, with programs like the Nigiri Project, and programs like the Fremont Weir uh, Notch and, and all the other Weir Notching programs. I'm not really going to talk about that. We're going to focus on fish food. Um, and, and the great thing about fish food is that um, when you're not working with fish, you have much less restrictions as far as permitting, um, and you have a much greater footprint that you can work with, right? We're talking about about a half a million acres that we could do just in the Sacramento Valley alone, and probably at least that down in the San Joaquin Valley. And it's, it's just a program that can expand um, to a much greater scale than, than uh, those wet side programs. Not to say that we should do one versus the other, right? We need both. We need a portfolio of conservation approaches, but this is one that... Um, we, we can start to take a lot more advantage of than we currently are. And I'll show you how it works. So uh, this is an animation of, of Reclamation District 108 when they've, they have done the fish food program with us for many years. This happens to be the year 2021. Um, it'll run through a couple of times, so I'll just talk through what we're looking at. On the top right, you see the date here. So it runs roughly from the beginning of December through uh, the end of March. And Every single one of these fields is going to light up blue when it floods. It's going to fade back to the base map when it drains. And all of this water drains through a canal infrastructure and back to the Sacramento River at that yellow star. That yellow star is where that photo of the, the pump dumping into the river um, was taken. And so essentially we're, we're reconnecting. I think this is about 7,000, maybe 8,000 acres of, of former floodplain, which is now rice fields. Um, into the Sacramento River uh, food web budget, essentially, and subsidizing the Sacramento River um, with, with floodplain-derived nutrients um, through this management action. What you'll also notice is that some of these fields turn on and, and so flood and then drain and then turn back on and flood and drain again, right? This is a, a cultural shift in the way that we manage um, flooded agricultural fields in the Sacramento Valley. Typical conventional like rice field management would flood up in after harvest, basically enough to decomp the water, maybe a little bit deeper if you're gonna hunt waterfowl, and, and just leave it. Maybe top it off throughout the season, and then if there's anything left at the end of waterfowl season, drain it, but typically there's not much left, it just all evaporates, and none of that water really gets back to the Sacramento River. And so um, conventional management would have one flood and maybe a very minimal drain kind of in the month of February. What we're doing here is, is, like Paul said, flooding a little bit deeper so we get a bigger volume of both water and food to export and draining it multiple times so we extend um, into across the calendar year um, more opportunities for food to get uh, back to the Sacramento River and then basically for fish to have access to that food. And that's going to give us lots of opportunities for different run types and different water years to benefit from this type of a management action. Um, and then, so how do we measure that? Well, uh, I'll zoom in a little bit just on kind of the region around the pump. Basically, we do it with all those same cage fish studies that uh, Jacob talked about before. We, we cage fish 
Uh, and so we force them to stay in a habitat and we monitor their growth in that specific habitat. So we've got cages upstream of this fish food delivery system. So they're not getting any of the food, right? The water is flowing down. The food that's subsidized into the river flows down with it. So those fish that are upstream don't have any access to it. Those are fish that experience the baseline river food web conditions. Then we've got cages at the outlet, which experience basically this full dose of floodplain food subsidy. And we've got cages further downstream that, you know, we think they might get a little bit of a benefit. It's certainly diluted. It's not the full strength of floodplain benefit, but it's, it's maybe it's better than the upstream. And so we are trying to characterize this, this whole reach of, of food subsidized river and see how do fish respond to this type of management action. And um, the results are, are pretty stark, right? So the upstream fish look just like those river fish um, in the previous pictures that you've seen. They, they start small and they end small. There's not really a whole lot of growth opportunities for those fish. The fish at the outlet, they look almost just like those floodplain fatties. I mean, they're, they're in the river, so you know, they're, they're experiencing different conditions, but they're getting a ton of floodplain food delivered to them and they grow accordingly. They look like a very healthy, very robust fish. And even six miles downstream, so this is a significantly diluted um, food subsidy that these fish are experiencing, they grow much more similar to this, this floodplain looking fish than they do to a baseline river fish. So this is not just a localized effect, this is a, a management approach that can subsidize a, a wide, um, a, a far distance of, of downstream habitats with augmented food. And so uh, just the numbers here, we see this, this Outlet fish is growing over eight times faster than the upstream fish. The downstream fish is growing um, about half that, but still four times faster than the, the baseline river growth in this reach of river. Um, so, you know, we've done this program for, I think we're in our fifth year of like large scale uh, floodplain drainage and fish monitoring. And the results from every single year, they vary a little bit wet to dry year, but um, they're all basically showing the same pattern. And I wanna talk a little bit more about the science um, that we're working on right now because we have a ton of data, right, that shows that fish that are, are forced to stay in this food subsidy grow really well compared to other fish. But what we don't know a lot about is um, how does this growth rate affect the rest of the fish's life cycle like Carson was talking about? And how do fish that aren't forced to be there, right, fish that are just migrating downstream, how do they interact with an augmented food habitat scape uh, like the ones that we're creating. And so um, this first um, partnership we've worked with Miranda, so she was formerly at Carson's lab in, at the Center for Watershed Sciences, now she's with Delta Stewardship Council, but she looked at fish from our study here and did that same kind of isotopic analysis um, that Carson was talking about, looking at the sulfur uh, concentration in the sequential layers of the eye lenses and and in this same exact um, framework of an experiment that we do our growth rate studies in, she looked at the difference between these upstream fish, the outlet fish, and the downstream fish. And after just one week of being in these habitats, the outlet fish start to look just like floodplain fish that um, they looked at in, in previous studies. And I think that's why Carson was careful to say, like, not just a floodplain fish, but a, a fish that is getting access to floodplain resources, right? These fish that are in the river but are getting a strong dose of access to floodplain resources look isotopically just like a floodplain fish. Um, and the downstream fish uh, are somewhere in between, right? They're not getting that full dose. It takes a little bit longer um, for them to really differentiate, but, but they do look more like a floodplain fish isotopically than they do like a baseline river fish. And so not only are we getting, um, you know, proximal growth rate benefits out of this management action, but we're also, we think we, are, we have the potential here to like imbue these fish with greater survival benefits throughout their life cycle. Um, the next partnership I wanna talk about is with our grad student. Um, right now we're sponsoring Adrian Loera. He's uh, just started his master's at UC Davis. He's working in uh, Dr. Rob Lusardi's freshwater fish ecology or uh, wetland ecology lab and um, he is looking at this question about wild fish, right? Or, or not wild fish, but free swimming fish. So um, the, uh, the federal hatcheries at Livingston Stone and at Coleman, they use the same kind of technology that Alex was talking about, these JSATS tags, to um, measure the survival of their releases of fish 
from up near Redding all the way down the Sacramento River with this acoustic uh, array. Um, they can you know, detect these fish as they migrate downstream sequentially. Um, and so, like I said, it's really hard to get permits to work with these fish and even harder to get permits to release experimental fish into the river. So we're not touching any of these fish. We're just piggybacking on the federal releases of these fish up at Redding. And we've put receivers um, right around our uh, cage locations in this exact same framework, right? So upstream at the outlet and downstream. And we're looking at how much time do fish free swimming in the river. So they, they, we didn't put them anywhere. They have total free will to choose. Are they migrating on the left side, on the right side of the channel? Do they want to hang out or move on quickly? You know, it's, it's all up to them. How do they behave around a feature uh, like this, where, it, where it, we're giving them extra food at the river in a certain point? And the data is super preliminary. We're working on a couple more seasons of, um, of projects with Adrian. But so far, fish at the outlet are spending about four times as much time in that one location relative to the upstream location. And even at downstream locations, they're spending a lot more time than they do moving past that, that receiver at the upstream end. So there's still a lot more work to do here looking at you know, transit time between reaches and, and how you know, do they spend more time much closer to the outlet versus further downstream. You know, we're, we're looking into all that, but, um, but this is pointing to kind of all together that we're creating a a habitat benefit that's not just useful in the short term, it's useful for these fish in the long term, and wild fish can actually detect this and, and will move accordingly to benefit from this um, in, in their free swimming migrations downstream. Uh, so another question is, how do birds use these fields, right? So a lot of the work that we've done on the floodplain is piggybacked on the success of flooding for waterfowl for the Pacific Flyway. And the last thing we want to do is say, okay, great job, everybody. Now we're just going to switch to fish food and you know, forget the rest of the birds, right? We're not going to do that. We want to make sure that the work that we're doing on fish food fields compared to conventional rice management, um, you know, we, we want to know what the trade-offs are uh, in those two different management strategies for waterfowl, for shorebirds, for wading birds. Understand what those are and, and work with bird biologists to um, kind of put these management strategies in use in specific locations that are going to benefit both fish and all of these migrating birds on the Pacific Flyway that you know all, this flooded habitat is very important to also. So we have partnerships with the Nature Conservancy, um, Point Blue and Audubon and Ducks Unlimited. They've been doing bird counts on a lot of our fields. And I don't have uh, data on this one back yet, but I just wanted to make sure everybody knew that we were working on this. And, and we, we'll be, we will be able to share some data on this um, very soon. So um, the other big transition that we've had in our program that I'm super excited about is it's moved from this sort of piloting of a, um, you know, like a, a, a small project um, into sort of a, a public facing like open enrollment program. And um, for the last two years, we've run what we call a reverse auction or just kind of any sort of a, a bid process where we define um, exactly what we want people to do with this fish food practice and take applications from a wide range of growers who might be interested in doing this and pick the, the cheapest and the best bids um, that we want to fill and fill those and run the program that way as opposed to just saying, hey, Lewis, you manage RD108, you guys are great partners, like we want to give you all this money to do it right here. This way we have a wide range of outreach, we can do this all over the valley and, um, and really explore you know, the differences in this program as far as how it works in these different regions, but also how it scales up at, uh, at, at the landscape, you know, Central Valley um, level. And the way we've done this, um, the California Rice Commission through their California Water Birds uh, Foundation is hosting this, this basically practice um, and, and reverse auction application form. So you can go to this website, you can look up the practice requirements, you can fill out an application, and then um, we convene, for the last two summers, we've convened a selection committee to review all the bids that we get submitted through this um, and run them through these criteria. Uh, the selection committee includes um, our team at Caltrout, scientists from uh, UC Davis, um, folks at the Rice Commission, folks at Ducks Unlimited. We've invited some state agencies to participate. We haven't quite got the buy-in from them just yet, but we're hoping to um, kind of 
include them as well in the process um, in future years. And right now the criteria are super simple, right? We're talking about total acreage in your bid. Uh, the number of flood drain cycles that you're willing to do, the timing of when those drain events are going to happen, how far away your fields that you're going to manage are from the fish bearing channel that we, we know fish are in and we want to um, add food to that system, and how much is it going to cost per acre cycle to do that. And through just these really simple criteria, really simple scoring metric, we rank all the bids that we receive and then fund as many of the best bids that we possibly can. And um, what that looked like this year, we had a budget of 2.1 million. Uh, we received, hang on, I got the numbers here. We received bids, I wanna say it was $3.6 million worth of bids, so we had to whittle it down significantly. Um, and uh, we selected 26 and a half thousand acres from a total of 43,000 acres that were bid into this program. We, on those 26,000 acres, we selected 53,000 acre cycles, right? So that's multiple cycles per acre uh, from a total of 90,000 acre cycles that were bid into this program. Um, and that worked out to about 40 bucks per acre cycle to run this program. It's really not that expensive. And, um, and that's down from last year, which was the first year we did this open enrollment program from about uh, $45 an acre. So. Uh, it's getting, as we, as the program gets more momentum and, and outreach gets more efficient, we're, uh, we're attracting more interest so that we're able to be more selective and, and get a product, the same product for a, a cheaper value. So it's, it's really working um, in a way that we think can be sustainable in the long run. Um, and as you can tell, like we have way more bids than we can fill. So, you know, in in a way that's good because we can be selective, but in another way, you know, the program has a lot of potential to grow if we had more money in our budget. So um, there's, there's a lot of room for expansion. This is what that 26,000 acres looks like on the landscape. This is a uh, Google Earth tells me this is 140 mile eye elevation view. So from really high above the valley, you can see the impact of these fish food acres on the landscape. Um, and, and that's only 26,000 acres. We've been talking, we could do this on half a million or you, you cut that down, you know, a quarter of a million, that would be 10 times the coverage of this. Um, and, uh, and, and that's when you start to get to um, a really uh, impactful landscape scale type of conservation program. And uh, that's how I kind of want to close this out. I just want to add one thing to this map and it's this little pink dot here on the bottom. Um, that's probably the biggest uh, inland restoration project that has happened in the last decade. That's Lookout SLU um, restoration program in the North Delta, Liberty Island area. It's a great program, right? I, I don't put this comparison up there to, to talk bad about that program. That project is, um, is awesome, right? It's, it's I wanna say 1,600 acres, you know, totally converted back to wetlands, tidal sloughs, like it's, it's a really great program. But that's the biggest we've done in a long time. And, it's not at the scale of the, the problem that we're trying to address, which is declining fish populations. Um, with, with just a fraction of the money, we can do something like the fish food program every single year and integrate a, a wide range of the landscape and, um, and, and have a, a much bigger impact on these fish populations year to year, I think. And so, um, Again, that's not to say that these types of restoration projects are, are bad, right? We want to string a lot of them together. We want to have fish access in, in more places that naturally flood and naturally have tidal energy, naturally have that high residence time that creates food web productivity. Um, but we need to pair it with conservation management strategies that also um, provide ecosystem benefit um, where we, we don't pull those, um, those properties out of their uh, their land use um, that they're in, right? We're not gonna reconvert all these farms to a habitat, but they can still provide habitat when they're not providing um, farm, uh, farm values and farm production. And the issue that I have here that I'm kind of, you know, putting a plea out to you guys is that there's not the same kind of, of funding opportunities, um, regulatory structure, permitting, um, permitting rules to to do like a conservation easement strategy like there is for this more traditional restoration type approach. So um, I'm looking to the community here um, to really
value, start to value the types of benefits that we get from conservation easement programs that um, is not restoration and to start to open our portfolio of conservation strategies to programs like this because they really can be powerful and, um, and can expand uh, much faster than we can in, in traditional restoration programs um, to recover these species. So uh, these have been some of our, our most important partners uh, for the last you know, five to 10 years as far as funding the program, hosting the program, uh, partnering on the science. So thank you to these folks. There are tons of other people I could thank who've been participating in the program. So you know, this is not an exclusive list, but um, these folks in particular deserve some attention. And um, yeah, thank you all for your attention. And I can take questions if for whatever time we have left. Great. Thanks, Jacob. And I think Mark has a question. Jacob, I really enjoyed your presentation. A um, couple things. Your, your point about easement, I th easements, I think, is, is well taken. We're actually looking to hire uh, a lands person in the Central Valley who would be focused on rice easements. And so this kind of, you know, the, the, the value of certain fields relative to producing food for fish could certainly be part of uh, where you would focus an easement program. So that's something that we'll definitely consider. But I had a question, too. Um, any I sense... you going to offer me a job. I think we were hired. We were interviewed for that position yesterday, actually. Um, Shucks. But I did have a question for you. Any sense of the um, you know, the importance of distance of a rice field from an export point? You, it, it certainly is part of your criteria. I saw yep. that. But do you actually have any kind of quantitative? Uh, information that that kind of speaks to the law of diminishing returns the farther a rice field might be from that uh, export point or is that just an assumption you're making at this point um, a little bit of both we have some anecdotal evidence from specific drainage experiments that we've done and measured distance downstream where we can detect those food resources so uh, the best example I have for you is um, Davis Ranches is a property um, kind of near the town of Calusa, and we and they drain their all their water through the Calusa drain, the 2047 canal. And so we were in I forget the exact winter. I want to say it was 2018. Uh, they drained about 3,000 acres, and we tracked that 3,000 the food from that 3,000 acres down 15 miles in the Calusa drain. Um, so that's one example. I don't think that that's a rule by any means because there's a lot of interplay between how much acreage you drain together, right? You know, draining 10 acres compared to 10,000 acres, you can push water much further. Uh, what the drainage infrastructure looks like, right? Is it a, is it a year-round wet canal so you have to displace a lot of water before you get your fish food water out behind it? Or is it a dry canal where that fish food water runs straight through and basically all of it gets out? Um, and then how big that canal is too, right? How quickly can it move the water? Um, so there's a lot of variables at play, uh, and I don't have a specific rule. I know that with enough acreage, you can certainly move it a far distance. So 15 miles, I think, is by no means a cap, but we can definitely move it 15 miles. Um, and I think we could probably move it further given enough acreage managed together and the right um, transportation canal infrastructure conditions. One more, and then we'll move to the next speaker. Jacob, you seem to indicate that this is a program we can do right now to help some of our uh, most threatened fish, fish right now. Um, and I think you were alluding to the fact that there's almost no funding for this program next year. Um, yeah. So uh, I, I just wanted to, I guess, take the opportunity to raise the level of awareness that uh, it's really difficult to raise funding for these programs. And it's really urgent and I think important with the state of our fish and how long it takes to do some of the other projects. This is an interim measure. And I don't know if you have ideas or thoughts on what you guys are doing right now for long-term funding. But uh, um, anyway, it, this is an immediate need for all of us. Yeah, thanks for emphasizing that, Lewis. We definitely are looking for funding both for next year but also long term. I, I think this is the type of program, because we have such differences in water year types, it would be great to have, you know, decade level dedications of funding, right? So we have $20 million over five or 10 years to spend, and then we can cater that spending to types of years when it might be more impactful than others if we have some indication about, 
you know, some, the type of water year we're going to get. Um, but yes, absolutely. So uh, conservation easement programs traditionally are held in, like Mark said, lands programs like CDFW has a lands department. Um, and NRCS has different types of easement programs. So that's kind of the vision that we have for it is, is adopting this program out to an organization that hosts easement programs like that. Um, but I'm totally open to other op opportunities. Um, if anybody has ideas for me or funding opportunities, I, please you know, let me know. We'd be happy to apply um, and, and, and share some of this data. And it really is a powerful program. Um, that that can grow significantly. Um, the interest is there, right? Every place I go to to give presentations like this or bids that I get from, from new growers, everyone says, oh, hey, if this works this year, I could do 10 times this acreage next year. Like, it, there is no shortage of places to do this. The shortage is in funding to be able to pay for a program like this. Um, and I think the science that we have put together shows that it has um, a huge amount of impact for the salmon population. So we got to connect those dots. Thanks, Todd. Jacob, thank you. Yep. Thanks, Jacob. Um, boy, it's a really a, a good reminder of just how blessed we are in this state with the incredible CSU and UC system that we have here as a resource, and in particular, just that regional, you know, university with the UC Davis and just the role that that's playing in a lot of the science with graduates of UC Davis uh, here, many of whom are in attendance today, as well as just the, the, the ability through the Center for Watershed Science and then also the, the graduate students there to help with a lot of this science. So um, just an incredible resource here. Um, full disclosure, I, I am a graduate of UC Davis. I do have a science degree. Unfortunately, it's a political science, but... <laughs> um, but yeah, not, not to undercut any of that, but yeah, there's just some incredible work going on and I appreciate every time I learn something new about just all the great work that's happening here. So um, great. Um, moving on, we're gonna shift a little bit to the, the bird side of things, which I think as uh, Jacob Katz said, uh, and also I, I believe Paul in their presentations, we learned early on the value that floodplains play and just the energy source that they can be because of the role that they've played with the flyway. And that's been just, just huge. And the, the science that's uh, behind that uh, really has helped to guide some of the efforts that are underway now to create food for fish and, and for other species as well. So um, we're going to now pivot and talk, go back to talking about the birds. And uh, with us, we have uh, Mark Petrie, and he's going to be talking about the floodplains and the role that they play for the Pacific Flyway. So, Mark, thank you. Great, we got it, yes. Thanks, Todd. For those uh, who I haven't met, uh, my name is Mark Petrie. I'm a biologist with Ducks Unlimited um, out of our Sacramento office here, although I actually work in our field office in Vancouver, Washington. This was actually supposed to be a talk um, split between myself and Christy Debola of uh, Point Blue uh, Bird Observatory. Unfortunately, Christy is ill, and she was going to speak to the non-waterfowl side of things, and she sent me a couple couple things last night which I tried to turn into a slide or two, but the reality is I'm not going to be able to do justice to those other water bird species that Christy would have done, so um, sorry about that. Um, I, during the 2014-2015 drought, um, the issue of, of fish recovery kind of came up within Ducks Unlimited. We recognized that we recognized at that time that, that the drought had been made essentially more difficult or had been compounded by the fact, by the needs of endangered fish species. And so we began to have discussions about, well, how do we plug in to salmon recovery in the Central Valley? And that's not to say that we hadn't done projects that were benefiting fish. We had. Um, but to Jason, to Jacob Katz's earlier point, how do we get involved in fish recovery at a scale that's meaningful? Um, and, 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 and so we, we we, we recognize that, and of course, the floodplain reactivation effort now underway in the Sacramento Valley is an opportunity to plug in at a very meaningful scale. Uh, what I wanted to do, though, before I shared some very brief thoughts about the whole fish, waterfowl, floodplain interface, I wanted to talk about the importance of the Sacramento Valley from a waterfowl standpoint, just give you some background there, much of which will be familiar to folks in this room. So. 
with Index Unlimited, we've actually divided up the Pacific Flyway into seven regions, seven conservation areas, if you will, of which the Sac Valley is one of them, and I'm not sure. Yeah, there we go. You can't see it really, really well here, but it's right here. And you can see that geographically, it's relatively small uh, when, when, when considered in the whole flyway context. But the Sac Valley is actually almost 20% of the Pacific Flyway Duck Objective, even though it's a relatively small area within the Pacific Flyway itself. I haven't calculated what that number is for geese, but my guess is the Sac Valley supports somewhere probably greater than 50% of all the geese in the, in the, Central Valley, in the uh, Pacific Flyway. Um, and it has about nearly 50% of the overall Central Flyway Duck Objective. The reality is the Sacramento Valley, in terms of area, is probably the most important area for wintering and migrating waterfowl in North America. Um, when you consider, this, just on a per acre basis, there's really nowhere else in North America that supports that many waterfowl on a per acre basis. So I really can't overstate the importance of the Sac Valley from a waterfowl standpoint, both within the Central Fly, both within the Pacific Flyway and continentally. Um, about 60% of all the food in the Central Valley for waterfowl is provided by rice, and nearly all that rice, as folks know, is grown in the central, is grown in the Sac Valley. Um, it's also really, rice is actually very important from a hunting standpoint too, and by that I mean winter flooded rice. If you look at where hunters do their hunting in the Central Valley, about 30% do it on private wetlands, and by that I mean duck clubs by and large. About 30% in rice field leases, and about 40% in public wetlands. So that's kind of the breakdown of the Central Valley hunting community, if you will. We know that public wetlands, for the most part, are really oversubscribed in terms of the demand that's placed on them by hunters. And so losing that, losing the hunting opportunities associated with rice fields, winter flooded rice fields, in many cases, there's nowhere else for those hunters to go because our public lands are already so overcrowded and there's so much demand placed on them. So I didn't want to miss that point about how important rice fields, winter flooded rice fields, are to the hunting community in the Central Valley. Okay, um, I wanted to step back even a little bit further and kind of talk about, give you a perspective of the Sac Valley um, across the broader perspective of the Pacific Flyway as well. We have what we call the big three in the, in the uh, Pacific Flyway. Central Valley, what we call Sonic, which is Southern Oregon, Northeastern California, and actually contains part of our Northern Great Basin Conservation Area and our, and our um, Intermountain West Conservation Area. And then we have the Great Salt Lake. And birds kind of trade, in bef trade back and forth between these landscapes. About 70% of all waterfowl use in the Pacific Flyway occurs just in those three landscapes. So they're very, very important. A couple other things too, I'm not sure how well you can see it here. Um, kind of the crown jewel in this part of the world are the Klamath Basin refuges, uh, in especially Lower Klamath National Wildlife Refuge and Tule Lake National Wildlife Refuge. And as folks, as, and, and these, are, these are the two refuges here, and, and I suspect as most Folks know those two refuges have really been on their knees over the last four or five years. They've received almost no water. Um, and last year, uh, you know, in a typical year, Lower Klamath Refuge would have about 25,000 acres of wetland. Last year had zero acres. Tule Lake would have about 15,000 acres of wetlands. Last year had zero acres. Now, conditions on the refuges are a little bit improved this year, but only marginally so. So a very, very important part of the Pacific Flyway in the form of these two refuges has essentially been dry for the last three or four years. Uh, Great Salt Lake, which again is you know, one of the th three legs of the stool in terms of the big three. Last year, this time last year, the Great Salt Lake had the lowest water record, wa lowest lake levels ever recorded uh, since 1847. And about 300,000, the lake has about 300,000 acres of unmanaged wetlands around its margins. Nearly all of those were dry. And of course, at this time last year in the Central Valley, only about half of the wetlands that exist in the valley actually held water. Now, things are better, obviously, this year uh, in the Pacific Flyway. Uh, wetland conditions in the Central Valley are much more improved. A good snowpack from the Great Salt Lake improved lake levels there, too. Klamath Basin, um, the refuges are still in rough shape, although there is a little bit of improvement over last year. Um, 
oh, I, I kind of skipped over this. One of the things we did last year, too, um, to kind of get a better sense of the drought and what was going on in the Pacific Flyway, we flew surveys uh, between Klamath Falls and the Central Valley to see if that landscape kind of was providing any drought relief, drought relief for waterfowl. Um, it wasn't. Uh, most of those public areas, like many areas in the Central Valley, were dry at that time of the year. Now, again, conditions are much improved over last year. But my real point here is the drought really exposed a lot of vulnerabilities in the, central, in the Pacific Flyway, um, regardless of where you looked, which really, again, speaks to the importance of maintaining the quality of the Sacramento Valley for waterfowl, given all the other threats that exist outside of it. There's just not a lot to give up or a lot to lose. Okay, something that uh, within Ducks and Unlimited, we went through a strategic planning process over the last year or so, and one of the things that uh, I learned anyway through kind of interacting with the staff is the opportunity to restore wetlands in the Central Valley is not what it used to be. In the 90s, in the early 2000s, there was a lot of wetland restoration going on in the valley. But that's really, really slowed down really over the last 10 or 15 years. The reasons are probably multiple. Um, a lot of that land, a lot of the earlier restoration in the 90s was occurring on rice ground. Um, there may be fewer willing sellers of rice land now to restore to wetlands. Um, a lot of those were private duck clubs. There may be less interest in the hunting community to create new duck clubs. And agencies may not be as supportive of wetland restoration as they were 10 or 15 years ago. Point is, wetland restoration in the Central Valley is kind of slow to a crawl. And why that's important, it, it, what, what makes that important, it means that the, that the habitats that we do have, both in the Sac Valley and outside of it, are, we, we have to maintain the quality of those habitats because if the quality goes down or we lose some of those habitats, there's not a lot of opportunity to replace them through wetland restoration. And that's probably true in the foreseeable future. Okay, um, and that's kind of what my point was here is that we really need to maintain the quality of the existing rice and wetland habitats both in the Sac Valley and elsewhere because there's not a lot of surplus in the system and parts of that system are already on pretty shaky grounds as we were able to see during the last drought. Okay, um, now I want to talk a little bit and just offer some tentative thoughts about, um, about the two things that we have heard here today, exporting fish food from rice fields on the dry side, and then the question of kind of weir management on the wet side. And as was pointed out, you know, this is, I haven't got, I don't think I have a pointer on this thing, but kind of conventional winter flooding of rice, uh, you know, begin to, typically happens November, the field is flooded, and then it's kind of maintained probably through February, March, and then it's dewatered. Um, Export, the, the, the fish food program, exporting fish food, uh, as Jacob pointed out, is more of a multiple blood ups and drawdowns. So you want to export across multiple time periods. So that's kind of the difference between conventional winter flooding, which is a more stable approach, and, and managing a rice field, a winter flooded rice field for fish food production. And then weir management, of course, is, to my understanding anyway, is kind of being more proactive in how those weirs are managed. So not just relying on a fish, on, relying on a flood event, but actually notching the weirs so that you can increase the duration and frequency which those bypasses are flooded. So those are the kind of two, I think those are the kind of two main tools we heard about today in terms of giving the fish more access to the floodplain or more access to floodplain uh, food resources. Okay, so this is a, uh, so I'll just give you some tentative thoughts um, within Ducks Unlimited about, about those two approaches, if you will. Um, this is, a, this is a, a layer showing the current blended rice acreage in the Sacramento Valley. In the Sacramento, uh, Valley. What this slide shows, and I'm not sure how well you can see this from the back, those, that's the same layer, but the dark green you're seeing there, those are winter flooded, those are fields that have been winter flooded for three or more years between 2016 and 22, and many of them were flooded more than three years, but those are the ones that have kind of been traditionally or consistently winter flooded. And so from both a waterfowl standpoint and a waterfowl hunting standpoint, they're probably, they've probably been disproportionately important just because of the consistent resources they have provided over time. And so, you know, some of our initial thinking is when we're looking at, when we're looking at the opportunity to winter flood through a fish food program, those areas that 
traditionally aren't winter flooded or haven't been all that frequently, maybe because water costs are too expensive in the area. Those are potentially really, really good candidates to bring into a fish food program. Now, I'm not saying that areas that are in the dark green should in any way be avoided or excluded from a fish food program. That's obviously a landowner decision. That's, that, those are the people who make those decisions. But if there are real opportunities in those light green areas to bring into a winter flooding program on behalf of fish, all that does is increase the level of winter flooding across the entire Sac Valley, which floats everybody's boat. And really, that's my only point I'm making there. Okay, talk a little bit about um, flood impacts. And by flood impacts, I mean may maybe managing the weirs differently than has done in the past, doing it more proactively to give fish uh, more, more uh, to give fish better access to the floodplain on a more frequent basis. Uh, Dan Smith, who's a waterfowl, sci a waterfowl scientist in our Sacramento office, has been looking at this question um, from both a hunting and a wetland management um, perspective. He's also looking at it from a pure waterfowl perspective, but I'm not gonna share those results today because they're still preliminary. So what Dan did is, and I'll, I'll, I'll address the, the hunting part of it first. And it'll take me, Dan, if you're watching, I hope I don't butcher this, but I'll try and do a good job here, or try and reflect what you've done. So what Dan was interested in, he was like, okay, if we are going to manage these weirs differently than we have done in the past, which, which probably means, you know, flooded more frequently, perhaps to a greater depth, what that, might that mean for hunting opportunities in those bypasses? And this is just a little background information, so... By and large, waterfowl are in the Central Valley from late August to about the end of March. That's when we see most of our migrating and wintering waterfowl. And you can see that they typically peak in late December and early January. Now, the hunting season runs from about third week of October to about, oh, really, in mo really the end of January. And then we have a season for military veterans and we have a youth hunting season. So what you're seeing there in the light green is kind of when ducks are actually hunted in the Central Valley. From a wetland management standpoint, which is the other thing Dan looked at, was to manage a seasonal wetland for kind of maximum food production, the typical approach is to draw down that wetland, essentially dewater it by the end of March, early April. If you do that, you're likely to get really good food production. Okay, so that's kind of what's going on from a wetland management standpoint. Okay, so what Dan did, and here's where I hope I don't butcher what he did, the blue, um, the blue essentially captures the length of the hunting season in the Central Valley. And what Dan tried to do is he said, okay, there's a bunch of days there, essentially almost 107 days in that blue shaded area. What he tried to do was he tried to value those days from a, water, from a waterfowl hunter perspective, okay? And you can see then that value is reflected on the weight number on the y-axis, okay? And so what you can see here is this is opening day, or opening weekend, and those days are very highly valued by waterfowl hunters in the Central Valley, in the Sac Valley. Okay, that's, your, hunter, your success is probably gonna be very good on that opening day. Well, shortly after that, you essentially enter the, what we call the November doldrums. You don't necessarily have a lot of birds in the valley yet, remember that curve I showed you, and, and you've got 65 degree weather like we have today. Um, birds aren't moving around a lot, there's probably a lot of food at this point. And so by and large, hunting success isn't really as good during November and early December. And we're kind of at the tail end of that right now. So what Dan did was essentially devalued those days from a hunter perspective, right? And then you begin to get into the December period. And you get more birds coming into the valley, you get a higher peak population, you get weather that's more conducive to hunting. And so the value of those days goes back up. Hopefully we're on the verge of that right now. And then what happens is season is coming to an end and then you have a youth hunt and you have a military veteran hunt. Um, so Dan tried to weight all that. Um, it's subjective, yes, but I think his assumptions here are fairly, relatively reasonable. And I think they would probably reflect what your average duck hunter in the Central Valley feels about the value of a given day or period over time. And so what, what is this, you know, what's the usefulness of this? Well, 
the presumption or we're making anyway is if you're going to manage the weirs, well, let me back up a little bit. By and large, we think that whether we're talking about a rice field or we're talking about a managed seasonal wetland hunt club, if you will, water depths below 12 inches are good for ducks. That's what they prefer. Once they get over 12 inches, they're less attractive to ducks. And the idea being that, okay, if we're going to actively manage the weirs, there's, an op there's a chance that some of that duck habitat, if you will, is going to go higher than 12 inches. And Dan's looking at exactly how much that is, but that's a reasonable assumption to make. And so if you're going to do that kind of flooding on behalf of fish, weir management on behalf of fish, and drive some of that habitat above 12 inches, make it less attractive to waterfowl, and probably diminish your opportunity to kill ducks, well, that's going to be less important here in this window than it is here because hunters are really valuing this time and valuing it less here or they're having more success here than they're having there. So if we're looking for windows in which you might manage the weirs to the benefit of fish while minimizing, say, effects on hunting opportunity, the effects on the birds themselves, that's kind of the window that Dan is suggesting we might look at. Is it reasonable? Does it fit with what we know about fish and when we have to provide habitat on those floodplains, on the wet side of the floodplain? I don't know. That's ultimately up for fish biologists to decide. But from a waterfowl, from a waterfowl hunting perspective, that's where we think maybe one of the sweet spots are. Now, you can't see it here. This is supposed to be yellow, um, and it and it's corresponds to wetland management. We'll just say it's white. Um, the season is over. Those wetlands don't need to be drawn down until the end of March, early April. There is no conflict here. There is no conflict in terms of hunting opportunities, season's closed, and there's no conflict in terms of how wetland managers might want to manage their properties um, because essentially they don't care as long as the water is off sometime by early spring. So this is another window in which you could actively manage the wet side for fish and there'd be no bird conflicts. Um, so that's all I really have on the waterfowl side of things. Um, Christie and Point Blue are really, you know, they're, they're looking at it, frankly, from a wider array, a wider diversity, a wider diversity of uh, wetland-dependent birds, whether that be shorebirds, waterbirds, and riparian landbirds. And not surprisingly, um, the diversity and the timing and depth of flooding uh, is, is pretty important in terms of what you conclude about any one of those water bird groups. And, and they're, I, to my understanding, they're in the process now of doing a lot of bird monitoring on these fish food, on these fish food fields that Jacob identified um, to understand what, what are the impacts of managing rice fields differently um, on these different suites of bird groups. I wish I could do uh, that work more justice. Um, un unfortunately, I can't. I just I'm not as I'm not as familiar with those kind of studies as I should be, and so ultimately we'll have to leave that to Christy and others to share those results at a later date. But that's really all I have. Um, and and again, that's 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 from a waterfowl perspective, and from the perspective I think of the waterfowl hunter. So if anybody has, I think did I stay on time? You did. Yes, uh, we have a few minutes for about five minutes for for questions if there are any. Oh, Carson. Thanks, Mark. <clears throat> Sorry. I think that there's a lot of, you know, I think about the draining, particularly in the March-April time frame, that is actually quite complementary to the fish management side of things. And focus, I think it's worth getting cre giving credit for the habitats that are out there, particularly the natural habitat that's managing for water weeds in that time. And I think of it that, you know, there's these natural overlaps that make sense. And generally, if you can flood in March, April, and it's not flooding, then it's probably time to get fish out of the system as well. And I think that there's so many of those spaces. I've been, um, we've been talking about the, the bird fish benefit um, for a while. And I think it's just, I don't think the bird people, particularly the natural habitat, get enough credit for the, that March, April time period, particularly in Sutter and the, and the sink, in that there's so much opportunity there that's still... I think we can we can squeeze more blood from that stone, um, so to speak, and with just little differences. You know, like we're working with the National Wildlife Refuge in Sutter, 
And it's just the order with which they drain their fields sure. at March, April. And I think that those are places that we have a lot of opportunity. I was just curious if you, if you see that in that space as well and kind of how you see that part of it going forward and kind of. Well, Kurt, if I understand your question correctly, are you asking me, is there, do I see relatively little conflict, if you will, between birds? Well, I should say ducks because I really can't speak to, to, to other bird groups, if you will. I have to restrict my thoughts to that. So are you asking, do you see less conflict in maybe, maybe flooding those managed wetlands or managed rice fields at a higher level to benefit fish than they typically, than we typically would? Yeah, uh, maybe I'm during just, that during that yeah. say that during that you know February March period is that or, is or that... maybe I'm saying that in terms of conflict this is a very minor one in in the world with which we live in that, yes you know it that, is like we we are working around the edges of conflict it, it you know kind of this bird v duck I would even say that that's even a little dramatic is that you know there's so much of the overlap is positive that we're just working around the edges to kind of optimize both and and just you know making sure that there's credit where credit's due, I think that the bird people oftentimes don't get the credit for managing for the ducks that also benefits the fish, particularly in Sutter, and that working around the edges, I think there's a lot of space just around in that, that area, but most of it's positive. I even think about you know the flooding for Paul's project is that you know it might be an average of 10 to 12 inches across the field, but there's gradient across there, sure. and that it's tough to loop that whole check-in, to exam for example, it's like, it's not all like half of it's above 12, half of it's below 12, and that there's a lot more habitat and overlap there. That, you know, when, when we use like that 10, 12 inches for depth management, it's an average across. And the reality is that still a lot of that is available for birds and fish, and that that space is actually quite beneficial for both. And, and Carson, really, this is just a way for, and I suspect you're like, there's, there's lots of opportunity for overlap and cooperation. And, and in some ways, what Dan is doing here is just kind of, throwing our assumptions on the table and saying, okay, here's what we think from a bird standpoint. And again, a waterfowl standpoint, because shorebirds are very different and they could reach very different conclusions for shorebirds and other waterbird groups. But hey, this is what we're assuming. Come to us now and, and hey, how well does this match up or not match up with what you think has to be happening for fish out there? And you know what? If there's contradiction and where they overlap is great and there's no conflict, great. Where there is conflict, let's talk about how we resolve that and, and, and work our way around that. So really, that's just, that, that's just kind of a, we're just laying down some markers here on the table to kind of start a discussion along those lines. No, I, amen. And I've been talking with Dan. We've been having this conversation. I know you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thank you. Is that it? I got one more, Mark. Sure. Um, you've done quite a bit of research into the energetics and just how important some the acreage targets are to ensuring that there's the uh, energetics for the migratory species there and i know as we're looking at different water management scenarios there's you know trade-offs associated with how water is managed in the region and so can you go into a little bit about just the impact that if you know like we've experienced in drought years and then potentially if there is water that's that's reallocated out of the system just how that could impact the the energetics for the migratory waterfowl on the floodplains well i didn't speak to that today todd because dan's actually engaged in that question too and, and what what he's doing is is he's looking at different or he will look at different um, management scenarios for the bypasses if you will and and depending on what those scenarios are you might get some percentage of habitat that was available at 12 inches below now is flooded too deep and is unavailable and so he he will look at what the what the bioenergetic consequences what the food consequences of waterfowl are depending on whatever scenario you might adopt for a given weir management um, we don't have those to share yet because we're just i think dan is just getting that information from seaback to actually allow him to do the modeling it'll progress very quickly once we get that information and to the degree that it might color this i don't know you know one of the things that that probably will come into play is that late period you know the way the wetland management period where there's no apparent conflicts because you know, hunting season is over, and as long as the water is off by early spring, it's really not an issue for food production the next year. But the ta that, that period of the year, that, that late winter, early spring period, is also when we are most likely to see food deficits in the Central Valley. 
It's just, that's just kind of the natural way of things. You've had a lot of birds. They've been, they've been consuming a lot of the food. No new habitat is coming online, blah, blah, blah. So that supply-demand curve begins to kind of converge. So the degree to which a, a weir management alternative might, say, make everything unavailable and affect the supply of food resources um, to the extent that that's likely to happen, that would have to factor into the conversation, too. I mean, where are these conflicts and where are these overlaps where we can kind of find common cause? So that's probably the most likely area. Um, but those analyses, I think, will be short. They'll be, they'll be coming pretty quickly. Is that it? All right, thanks. Great. Well, thanks. And um, we're going to take a. Uh, okay, great. Um, we're going to take a break for, for lunch. For those of you online, we're going to pause. We'll be back at 1230, and uh, we'll begin the program again. And I believe that uh, Lewis and Barry will be up to talk about floodplains flood reimagined. Great. Thank you.